Someone out there in Cyberland, please uh, send me a ping. Please make it G-rated this time. I got the ping, so we're live. Thank you. Okay. Uh, I'm going to. At 6:31, I call the city of Castle Hill's regular meeting to order, and determine whether a quorum is present. A quorum is present. Thank you, Council. And uh, for the invocation, I'd like to invite Miss Diana Worstruff. We thank you for this day and for allowing us to assemble together this evening. We ask that you guide each of the city leaders here tonight, both in making their decisions this evening and in their daily decisions to do the best for their community. I ask your blessing for each and every one of us here today. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, Ms. Warsher. The Pledge of Allegiance, I believe we have one Boy Scout here this evening. <clears throat> Thomas. Please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. You may be seated. Thank you, Thomas. Okay, um, we'll start off by welcome, welcoming a newly appointed City of Castle Hills police officer, Jalen Brady and Garrett Earlywine. Thank you, Mr. Chief. Mayor, Council, staff, citizens. Uh, thank you all for coming out for the introduction of our two newest officers. Hope you'll stick around for the financial report as well. Uh, first, we'd like to introduce Jalen Brady. Both of these officers, by the way, gradu graduated in the same uh, cadet class recently, and they were both uh, very high in that class. We're grateful to have them. First is Jalen Brady. He uh, was from San Antonio primarily, went to Angelo State, where he obtained a bachelor's degree in criminal justice. His he's accompanied with his fiance, Sierra, and they are expecting their first child in August. Uh, Jalen Brady, if you'll come up, please, sir. City of Castle Hill. Thanks, I appreciate it. Anything I can do for you, let me know. Thank you. And second, we've got um, Garrett Early Wine. Garrett spent the last five years in the Army, he's recon and, and military police. He's currently a reservist. Comes to us from Nixon, Texas. He was uh, the best driver at the academy in the um, <laughs> in the pursuit training and everything else. So we expect the safe things there, and also a top five uh, cadet in the academy. And again, we're grateful to have Garrett. His girlfriend is currently a junior at Texas A&M. Senior. senior, senior. And uh, we're grateful to have Garrett as well. Good luck to you, and congratulations on your pursuit. May that really hang on a couple of calls. Okay, let's see what we have next here. I would like to invite uh, Monica Rangel to the front, please, where we're going to uh, proclaim Lupus Awareness Purple Ribbon Day on Friday, May the 18th, to be presented to Angelica Garza, but Ms. Rangel will be here this evening, Field Sales Director, South Central Texas Lupus Foundation of America, 
Lone Star chapter, and we can get that website to you. Uh, there's a lot of good information regarding that. Okay, this is a mayoral pro uh, proclamation for Lupus Awareness Purple Ribbon Day. I hereby on May the 18th, 2018, uh, by virtue of the authority vested in me as the mayor of the city of Castle Hills, do uh, proclaim that day Purple Ribbon Day and present this to you as a proclamation from the city of Castle Hills. Um, I will invite all business and local citizens and local religious organizations to support the cause of raising awareness of lupus by wearing a purple ribbon to support those who battle lupus. Get witness thereof, Timothy O'Donnell. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. We appreciate you and we appreciate your organization. Just recently, uh, I know that two of our uh, longtime residents have contracted lupus, and uh, I was hoping to have them here tonight to be able to uh, acknowledge the fact that we as a city are acknowledging it also. So, uh, but they couldn't make it. So, so thank you very much for what you do, what your organization does, and please let us know if there's anything else we can do. Thank okay? You thank you so much. Okay, the next one is the next one is a certificate of resignation. Uh, <laughs> that's a <laughs> folks, uh, that's a joke. Okay, most most people that know me, I, I really did misread this. Okay, that was pretty good, wasn't it? <laughs> okay, hope we got that on tape. Okay, certificate of uh, recognition. The The city of Castle Hills recognizes Delaney Dwyer. Delaney, are you here this evening? Thank you so much. Delaney, I don't want to belittle the beginning of this by anything that just happened. When you get older, you'll understand. <laughs> she is a seventh grader at St. George Episcopal School. She won first place in the seventh, eighth grade category in the San Antonio Book Festival 2018 Fiction Contest with her story, Crush. She won $500 for her school, $500 for herself, Whataburger for a year, I want to get to know you a little more, and rode on the Grand Marshal's float in the Texas Cavaliers River, River Parade during Fiesta. Delaney, I want to thank you not only for, for your innovative thoughts in, in writing that story, but also being a leader and being uh, to, to earn this award. Uh, you and people like you will be the future of our country. And I, as the mayor of the city of Castle Hills, salute you for winning this. Moving right along. The next item we have on the agenda is the, this is non-agenda my items. I would remind everyone that there is a three minute limit regarding uh, non-agenda items and uh, citizens to be heard. So with that said, first on the list is Mr. John Kinney. Good evening, John Kenny, 103 Briarcliff. Uh, Mr. Mayor, I just wanted to take a few seconds. Uh, I know we've been friends for several years and I keep bringing this up 
I have this battle every year, twice a year with brush pickup. Um, if I have more than three bags, they don't take anything, and I think that's a dumb rule. Take three bags, come back the next week, and take three more. I have had brush clippings out in my alley for a week and a half. I got a love note on my door from, uh, from Public Works that it had excessive brush. If any of you would like to see pictures, I took pictures of this brush. Uh, you can come by the alley. I'll be waiting for you out there because tomorrow morning I'll probably be the one out there loading up the garbage truck because our Public Works guys won't pick up brush. Um, and with that, I also have a picture of how my garbage cans are always thrown back in my garbage can area. If you'd like to see those pictures, I'll show those pictures to you also. Um, I think it's ridiculous that if we don't have our garbage cans in the right place and covered and blah, 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 and this rule and that rule, they won't pick up garbage. But then after they do pick up garbage, they just throw the cans back however they want. I'm tired of it. I just wanted to make an official comment. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Kinney. Uh, you do note under assistance to be heard that we cannot respond to a uh, citizen, but what we will do is make sure that the city manager gets in touch with Mr. Kinney along with Mr. Harada, and let's uh, see what we can do to correct this issue as quickly as possible. Okay, next on the list is uh, Ann Fitzsimmons. Fitz, Fitz Gibbons, excuse me, ma'am. Thank you very much for having me. I live at 205 Sheffield Place. And the reason I'm here is um, my husband and I have lived in, Santa, in uh, Castle Hills for over 15 years. And we're having an issue with our alley. At least your alley maybe is functioning. Ours is barely functioning. And the reason it's an issue for us is it's the only place we can park off the street. We have no circle drive. We have no driveway from the street to the back. The only place we can park is off the alley. We are going through major construction right now with, uh, I think it's AT&T. We have not been offered any kind of notification that they'll be working in the alley. But our experience has been with um, AT&T, with Grande, and uh, with Time Warner, they come in, they use the alley as the easement as they have a right to, but they never put the alley back in the condition that it's supposed to be. Um, I've contacted Public Works one time, and I think in the 15, over 15 years that we've lived here, they have filled one pothole. Um, I know that construction's gonna be a while, but I would appreciate it if Public Works would go through each of the alleys as the construction is done and make sure that these contractors are held to what they're supposed to do, which is to put our alleys back to the way they're supposed to be. I know that from experience and looking at the city of San Antonio, these alleys go by the wayside. We have weeds growing, the blacktop is disappearing slowly but surely, and I'm very concerned with the construction that's going on right now that it's going to be that way. So thank you very much. I appreciate it. Thank you so much, Ms. Fitzgibbons. Okay. Uh, Ryan, will you make sure that you get with Rick and we uh, identify the area involved in behind 205 Sheffield and also, for that matter, any alley areas that could be a problem with uh, uh, passage of uh, vehicles at exit or entrance from those alleys. Thank you so much. Uh, third on the list here is Jana Baker. Jana Baker, 304 Fox Hall Lane. I would like to thank all of the uh, new and old elected officials on their recent election. And I also, really, the purpose of my whole comments tonight are about um, the fiesta um, event that we had. It was the most spectacular we've ever had, and I want to thank Judy Crawford and John Kenny for all their efforts in making that happen. And I also want to uh, congratulate our first ever Fiesta Queen and Princesses, but I think that there is another group of people that we need to recognize, um, and I hope that 
the Fiesta Committee and the Council would agree. I think we need to, um, since we are a part of Military City USA, I think we should honor those who have sacrificed the most for us. And not just because they've donated money to become a queen or because their parents are on council, but to honor those who have truly sacrificed for us. And those are our military veterans. We should honor a veteran every year, every day, but we can make a special event where we honor them during Fiesta. During this last election, I had the honor to meet a neighbor of mine, Daniel Thornhill. Daniel is a wounded warrior. He served two tours in Afghanistan. During his last tour, he lost both legs above his knees. He suffered significant burns on his hands where his fingers burned off and fused. He also suffered a spinal cord injury, but he was one of the most amazing people and very positive regardless of what his physical injuries were. And it's people like Daniel and the sacrifice they have made for all of us to be able to be here tonight to speak and to openly have free elections and to have fiesta parades. And that's why I think I would really like to see this city step up and recognize the people who sacrifice and make all of this possible for us. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Baker. Okay, that was it on Citizens to be Heard. I'm going to move item announcements by the mayor and council members up to uh, now. So we're going to start with Douglas. Douglas, do you have any comments or um, things to say regarding uh, anything you want to talk about? You've got me for two more years. That's all. Uh, what do you say? Oh, two more years. Okay, good. <laughs> Mr. Paul, did you have any comments or, or whatever you'd like to say, sir? This is your time. Sure. You've got Thank three you. minutes. <laughs> it's not going to take that long. It's that much. Uh, I've served the city for 12 years, forum on council. I've done most all the committees and everything that I've been asked to do. I've done it to the best of my ability on what I think is right for the city. I'd like to thank the citizens for allowing me to serve them for doing this, and uh, thank you. Thank, thank you, Mr. Paul. Uh, Ms. McLean, did you, did you have any comments or for the... Uh, during just three minute time. Just a reminder that we are having our first annual citywide garage sale this year. It will be the weekend, February, not February, Friday, June 1st, Saturday, June 2nd, and Sunday, June 3rd. Your choice of dates that you want to participate. Thank you so much. And there is information regarding that at the uh, city offices. Is that correct? Or online on the city website? Is that correct? Thank you, Minnie. Ms. Scott, did you have any comments or anything for the public? I'm sure you do, Mr. Trevino, go ahead. Yes, sir, thank you, Mayor. Uh, so I wanted to thank everybody for having the opportunity to serve the city of Castle Hills the past two years. It has been an incredible adventure of learning about our city and the unique problems that we face and working with people in different departments outside of our city to try to make our city a little better. Um, I may be done working on this side of the dais, but I have no intention of being done working on the other side. So if there's any assistance that I can be, please feel free to contact me. Everybody has my cell phone, and I look forward to seeing you all at the next event in the Commons. Thank you, Mr. Trevino. Okay, uh, first of all, I wanna congratulate, uh, as I did on next door, the the three candidates that, that won uh, in this past election and thank everyone who got out and voted. Uh, that's an important right that everyone has and uh, whether your candidate won or lost, that's a democratic process and that's what it's, that's what it's all about. So we come together and we, and we work out our differences and we uh, recognize and uh, respect the ideas of all, okay? Because that's, that's the way it works up here. Um, 
I do want to point out that we do have two of our council members going to the Texas Municipal League Leadership Academy starting tomorrow and the next day. That's Ms. McLynn and Ms. Scott. They will be gone for two days. Uh, this does include a graduation and bring back the knowledge of how uh, municipal government should work. So thank you both for uh, taking your time out. This is your phase two, 30 hours, I believe, and we'll count towards college credit, which I'm sure y'all don't need, right? Or do, I don't know, but anyway. Um, also on a little serious note, um, you know, we have a lot of things happening around our country and a lot of things that uh, uh, happen and, and they catch us by surprise. And uh, I've been talking to other cities, I've been talking to residents, I've been talking to just about everyone regarding this and it's a protection of our citizens in this uh, uh, area. So starting in the next couple of months, we are gonna install metal detectors. So if you would like to come to a meeting, please make sure that you get here a little early because we're going to uh, act like we were at the airport, hopefully not as stringent, not as stringent, but we are taking action in order to not only uh, protect ourselves up here, but also with uh, additional exits and, and things like that. Uh, for those of you who do, don't know, the mayor is in charge of the property of, and I, I am not gonna have to explain to anyone why we didn't take this action at this time. You never know when it's gonna happen. Probably it wouldn't be, obviously it would not be one of our citizens but we don't know who comes in and out of those doors. Uh, it's not a required sign up thing. So anyone at any time could walk in here and make a tragedy of this building very, very fast. So we're gonna try to have this up and running in the next 30 days. And I would just, this is the second time we brought this up. And I would like to make sure that you know when you get here, if there's a line that it, it is for a purpose. So with that, uh, I do also wanna bring up the Fiesta and I bring this up in a, in a positive way because Jana came forward and she talked about what a great fiesta this was and I'm going to echo her sentiments. This was the best ever. Next year, we're gonna have to get a bigger boat, as they said in Jaws, okay? What that, what that also means is they put on a heck of a show. I've never seen anything like it. We lost a ton of money a ton of money for the first time ever. So what the reason I'm bringing that up is because these individuals work very hard and I would like to promote the CHCO because that's where they get their funds. And we have, we have movies that, uh, that the CHCO offers and other civic events. And, and I'd ask you to support those because this is where the money comes from and it comes from sponsors, and it comes from, I believe there's individual residents uh, who actually put up the $1,000 or, or whatever it is in order to do this. But this year it didn't work, and they lost a lot of money. So I would ask that we do, as a community, come together and uh, at least support uh, our CHCO, which is came from our uh, homeowners association, I believe, and and help these people next time around. Thank you very much. Okay, moving on. We're gonna move on to the consent agenda, which is approval of the city council minutes. The first one is special meeting held on March the 27th, 2018. And the second is the work session held on March the 27th, 2008. Is there anyone that would like to pull any one of these two items on the consent agenda, please? Do I have a motion to move the consent agenda forward? Please. Do I have a second, please? Second. Okay. All in favor? Is that approving it or moving it forward? It's approving it. Well, I have some changes to the minutes. I just asked that a second ago. No. <laughs> yes, I did. You asked about pulling it, but I have some changes to this, the minutes from the special meeting. Hang on. 
What we're going to do here, does anybody have a item that they want to pull and ask and talk about? Yes, I would like to pull the minutes from the special meeting, please. Mr. McLean, go ahead. Um, I believe that the, um, there are some inaccuracies in the, the description under discussion item under Roman numeral one. Um, I don't believe that I advised council that the city attorney had updated the ordinance to include language. I'd like to go back and make sure that that tracks the proper language. And I, there was one other change. Um, There was discussion, but I think the discussion um, was twofold. The first, the first motion that I had made had to do with the language tracking, the TABC language, and then the second was on the um, adding the language that actually gave a variance to CHCO to have alcohol for this particular event. And so I just want to make sure that the minutes reflect that correctly. Did you get that many? Okay, and that is an addition to the minutes as, as read. Okay, thank you. Um, Ms. Scott, did you have anything? Anyone else? Thank you, Ms. McLean. I'm sorry I didn't word that poorly. Okay, so with that said, we have the uh, let's go along and move ahead with the approval of the consent agenda. Uh, let's have a motion, please. We had Mr. Paul. Oh, we had Mr. Douglas. Gregory, and we had uh, Trevino. Do you all agree with the update on the consent agenda, please? Yes, sir. Okay, with that said, all in favor? It is unanimous. Thank you very much. All right, let's move on to new business. I'm moving item number four up to the front, which is conduct a public hearing and act upon a zoning commission recommendation to deny the removal of the word existing from section 50 Four nine seven A five of the zoning code, which currently states A five day nurseries, preschools, or kindergartens in conjunction with an existing public, private, or denominational school having a curriculum equivalent to grades one through twelve of the public school system. Mr. Brennan. Mayor, it's my understanding that the uh, Zoning Commission, after public hearing and discussion, uh, denied the application that was submitted by the uh, French School to delete the word existing from the current section 5497A5, which is a special exception uh, provision in, the, uh, in a residential district. Um, it's also my understanding from, I wasn't there, uh, from people who were there that there was uh, public support for making some change or, or, or accomplishing some uh, means of, of uh, authorizing the proposed French school uh, in the location that they proposed, which is at the Castle Hills First Baptist Church uh, facility. Um, <clears throat> Uh, different proposals were made and kicked around. I think from what I've heard, the sympathy of the commission was to, to figure it out in some way, uh, but th there wasn't an, any consensus that passed, so the recommendation or the re application was denied. It, it then moved to you all, uh, the city council, and uh, if there is an approval of something, it's gonna require a supermajority vote which would be four out of five because there was a denial at the zoning commission level. Um, <clears throat> I, I came up with some wording that I think would accomplish the, the goal, if the, if the goal of the city is to uh, take some action to approve the, the French school. And my, my suggested wording would be to add a new subsection A6 to the a uh, list of, of schools that could be uh, approved, such as the French school. Uh, and A6, in my uh, recommendation, would be to say a day nursery, preschool, or kindergarten located on a property for which the primary entrance to the nursery, preschool, or kindergarten facility fronts on the commercial corridors of Northwest Military Highway or West Avenue. 
and the, the effect of that would be to limit uh, the location of those kinds of schools to the main streets, the, the, the commercial streets. And I think that works because uh, the, the purpose of the other section that's already on the books is to uh, prevent the spread of more schools into residential neighbor, neighborhoods uh, without you know, complete uh, happiness of everybody, which that's always hard to achieve. And I would like to point out that where it, whatever is written into the code will require an SUP from the city council, which means that the city council will have absolute control over whether a, project, a, a, a proposed school would, would come into existence under any of the rules that we currently have. So uh, I, I, I assume, Mayor, that there are probably people in the, in the public that would like to comment on the school and possibly there would be some comments regarding what I just said. Thank you, Mr. Brennan. Okay, um, I also just got a text from the chairman of that board, so uh, what we'll do is we'll go ahead, since we are in the middle of a um, public hearing. Uh, let me see who signed up for that. Let's see, this is item number four. Yes, 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 yes. Okay. So anyway, what we'll do is we'll go, we'll go ahead and move forward. Let's go ahead and get a, um, start off with the first one, which Mr. would be Stephen Ackley. Mr. Mayor, I have a question. Go ahead. If we were to postpone this to another meeting, do we, when would be the appropriate time to make that motion, Mr. Brennan? I'm sorry, what was the question? I, if we postpone it, what? If someone were to make a motion to postpone this to our next council meeting, since the Zoning Commission couldn't come to a, an agreement about an alternate language, when would be the appropriate time to make that motion? I uh, could do it right now. If you, I if thought you we were want. in a public hearing, Mr. Mo Mr. Yeah, well, you know, I think it would be, uh, Ms. McLean, a kind of a courteous thing to go ahead and hear from the public before that type of a motion is made, but you know, I'll, there's no rule that says you can't make it any time. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Ms. McLean. Okay, um, Mr. Ackley. Stephen Ackley, uh, 118 West Castle Lane. I, I think as most people know, I've been a, a, a stalwart to, <laughs> Uh, opponent of anything that goes on at the Castle Hills First Baptist Church for many, many years. Um, however, um, you know, in our recent uh, uh, TIFF with the uh, basis school, for example, uh, I think we uh, came to the resolution that there are things that are appropriate to go into uh, that school. And it's kind of an irony that uh, the uh, French school, which is a very, very small school compared to what Basis had in there, uh, has to be uh, denied on it when we had to basically knuckle under to let the, to let the Basis school in there. So I, I, I'm uh, most in agreement with Mr. Brennan's uh, language on this. Uh, and the history on that, I think it was that the, uh, the uh, ordinance was put in with the word existing on it uh, in order to do exactly what Mr. Brennan said we were trying to prevent, and that's to expand uh, into the residential neighborhoods. I think this change in the ordinance would uh, effectively uh, uh, do that uh, and also allow uh, better uses for those commercial facilities like the CH uh, uh, school uh, and, the, uh, and the French school that's gonna come in. Um, I was able to uh, talk to the uh, the people at the French school, it's a very uh, nice uh, arrangement that they have. The number of students is very small, and uh, I, I think they would be a, a welcome addition to the neighborhood and, uh, in, in, our, in our area. So I encourage uh, that the uh, council take on the change in the language that Mr. Brennan has uh, proposed on this. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Ackley. Okay. Uh, next on the list is uh, Clyde, wait a minute, I'm sorry, is uh, Jackie Ackley. Thank you, 
you, Council and Mayor. Uh, I'm Jacqueline Ackley from 118 West Castle Lane. Um, I really think there's sort of two issues here. They are intertwined because consideration of changing the ordinance was to allow, or maybe not allow, the French school to come to that property. But um, the ordinance itself must be very carefully considered and please, well written in all means. I, um, I think one of the most important things about the ordinance is to make sure that the property that the church sits on, which is zone A residential with SUP for church, is not made into commercial property through the back door, say, of allowing daycare centers, even if they face Northwest Military Highway, uh, to exist for profit in, 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 in zone A residential property. I couldn't have my home as a daycare center and reap commercial profits from it. I don't think it's right for them. I do understand that a kindergarten in conjunction with a school makes sense. Uh, you begin your pupils young, they continue the curriculum. I do think the phrase in conjunction needs to be well defined. It shouldn't just be a daycare commercial sitting on the front of the property facing Northwest Military Highway wherein the conjunction is shared parking lot or shared restrooms or shared lunchroom. I think maybe the phrase have the same administration as a school, maybe we don't want it one through 12, but most preschools and kinders do go along with at least an elementary school, one through five, one through six, whatever elementary school is in that area of the country. So I think in addition to deleting the word existing, if we're gonna go that route, there needs to be additional changes to the ordinance too to make sure that the school is under the same administration as the academic progress, one through six, one through five, one through 12, but and maybe further define what in conjunction means and what grade levels it needs to be associated with. Um, those were my uh, main thoughts. And then if the ordinance is written well, then entertaining in the French school would be next, but a separate issue. And my understanding is that at least initially, they're only planning to bring preschool, kindergarten, plus or minus first grade. So they wouldn't even finish fit or meet the requirements of an ordinance as I was describing where you have to have at least an elementary school to bring in the, the preschoolers. What I really want to avoid is having commercial daycare centers on zone A residential property. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Uh, Ackley. Also wanted to make everyone aware that the chairman of the uh, zoning has entered the chambers. And uh, uh, Joe, I'm gonna add your name to the list here. Okay, I just wanted to make sure you knew that, okay? All right, let's move on to the next uh, person that signed up, and it is Jana Baker. You yes, ma'am. Thank you. Okay. The next item on uh, the next person on the list is Leslie Winger. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. First of all, I'd like to commend Ms. McClinton's intention to postpone this because it is a very complex issue and shouldn't be decided that quickly. But I do want to mention that I'm sure I'm not the only person in the city who has heard repeated complaints from residents throughout the city about the traffic on Northwest Military and West Avenue, particularly during school times. So this is a really major issue and moving you know, anything that we're talking about to those streets is not going to help anything, it's simply going to exacerbate it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Winger, for your comments. Okay, the next person, um, Al, you're signed up, but I'm not sure what it was for. Al Molinar? For what, sir? Oh, thank you, okay. All right, let's move on to Charles Mott. Good evening, I'm the uh, president of the Alliance Francaise. I'm here in support of the French School. We're one of the partners to this school. Um, to my knowledge, this is the first time a school like this will be uh, started in the city of San Antonio in its history. Uh, I think
think it's a very fine, well-conceived school, very small. I think the class, uh, if I'm not mistaken, it's gonna be limited to, I think, 40 students, 42 students. Um, I was here last week at the Zoning Commission hearing. Uh, I would simply respectfully ask that this body um, make its decision to alter, you know, your zoning um, ordinance in a timely fashion. Otherwise, it will jeopardize the uh, viability of this school opening this fall. You have parents that are interested in attending, but if you don't have a location to represent and invite parents to, you will have parents that will be skeptical about the viability of the school. They are running out of time. Uh, we are, uh, as if I understood the zoning commission decision was to push this off to the first week of June with no assurance that it was gonna be decided then. So if we're into July, you're talking about six weeks to tell parents we have a viable school. And I don't think that that's going to be uh, a good option. So respectfully request that whatever decisions, and we certainly understand and acknowledge the importance of this ordinance and what you're trying to accomplish by keeping daycare centers from opening in residential areas. We respect and acknowledge that. But it seems to me that with the help of your attorney and a good wordsmith, you could come up with language that accomplishes your goal in a timely fashion. So I thank you for the opportunity to, to speak to you. Thank you, sir, for your comments. Okay. Um, next item is Katita. Thank you, Katita. I don't want to wreck your last name, so if, uh, go ahead. Thank you, Ryan. <clears throat> um, the City Council, would like to ask the City Council to um, consider amending the code um, uh, in order for our school, the French School of San Antonio, to request a special use permit to occupy the building at the Castle Hills Church complex, um, because right now we are not able, our case is not is, is not, we're not able to present our case to the Zoning Commission. Um, and I think we just wanted to say that um, we see a lot of interest in the school from um, the community. We think it will be a great addition to the community. We're, uh, we're confident we'll be a good neighbor. Um, we are going to be a very small school with only 42 students in this year, and we aim to add one grade each year. So this year we're only enrolling from pre preschool to first grade, and we are adding each grade every year until we reach fifth grade in 2022. And by 20 2022, we're not going to be even more than 100 and 50 students. I think we'll be around 100 students by the year of 2022. This is really insignificant comparing to the current tenants at the Castle Hills Church uh, basis who is moving out this August. They're moving out. Those facilities are going to be unoccupied. Um, so that's why I think it will be, it's, it's good for the building to be occupied and we're going to be really, really small. We're also offering before and after school care so this way we will offer a staggered drop off and pick up time so there won't be um, any traffic impact in the city. Um, we're also um, in a discussion with the local businesses like Celebi Bakery to uh, provide lunches for our school. So I think for this uh, relationships we will bring additional dollars to the city budget. Uh, we're also thinking about organizing our bus tea day celebration in July at the veranda at the Castle Hills uh, in Castle Hills. So I think through this events and, and um, other um, um, events maybe with the local vendors, we will also bring additional money to the budget, city budget. So overall, I think we are, we just want to respectfully ask you to amend this code to let us uh, um, be heard at the Zoning Commission and um, um, to present our case. And thank, thank you. Thank you, Katia. Uh, next we have uh, Michelle. Yes, I was here with Katia because we are co-founder of the French School of San Antonio, so she said uh, 
everything we, uh, what needed to be said. I just want to, um, to say that we, even if we are enrolling a very young student from two years old and only until first grade this year, we are not a daycare, so because I heard uh, one of the citizens uh, was afraid that uh, daycare will open uh, in your city, so we are a real school and our administration will be like a school administration. We are a school and we will have a grade each year and we will be a full elementary school. So thank you. <laughs> thank you, Sharon. Okay. Um, let's see if there was anybody else signed up for this. Al, you're gonna hold. Okay. Um, we're going to move into a, a situation where, excuse me, or Joe. Joe is down here. Joe, would you mind coming up, please? We have with us Joe Isbrand, Chairman of Zoning. Good evening, Mayor and Council Members. I apologize for being late. I didn't know you were going to move it we up. We moved on the it agenda, up. Is all our fault. Jake. But I'll let you know I still managed to drive the speed limit and get here in just two or three minutes. So I'm grateful to live in this city. Um, well, that's Mayor, good to know. But you are under oath. So, uh, Mayor and Council Members, just to give you the the context of the action that we took, the Zoning Commission met last Monday, May the first. At that time, we had two items on this agenda. One was to consider a change in the zoning ordinance. The second was to consider the application of the French school. I think it's important to distinguish this because the action that was taken by the Zoning Commission, I believe, and they can represent their own opinion, but I believe the action that was taken on item number one regarding the change in the zoning ordinance is irrespective of the application that was before us because we had not considered that yet. The uh, Zoning Commission voted unanimously, that's a five-zip vote, um, to recommend to you that we deny, that you do decline to change the uh, language in the ordinance, specifically the term existing that is currently in there. I would remind you that last September 12th, you voted unanimously, by the way, to insert that language into the ordinance. And this goes back to my first point. I think it's very important that, w that when we look at an ordinance, we really question whether it is good public policy for an ordinance to be pliable, that we change it each time an application comes before the Zoning Commission. I believe that's what the concern of the commissioners was. As Mr. Brennan has indicated, the Zoning Commission is certainly open to considering what is in the best interest and the welfare of this community but I believe there is hesitation when every time you have an application or an applicant come before the Zoning Commission, you also have a request to change the zoning ordinance, which really should stand the test of time, I would hope. So eight months ago, it was changed. Now the ask is to change it back again. And I think, again, this is why the Zoning Commission uh, unanimously made the uh, determination that it did. Um, lastly, I would say that, as you know, because you appointed them, that there is a zoning ordinance committee that has been established to review all, the entire zoning ordinance for the city of Castle Hills. They have worked tirelessly for well over a year and have begun to present their recommendations to the Zoning Commission. We have had a number of work sessions, public sessions, on that to be able, with the intention of being able to present to you a comprehensive recommendation on a change in the zoning ordinance. So again, I think the intent of the zoning commission would be to allow the commissioners to do their work, to work with the committee, to look holistically at the ordinance and how it applies across the board uniformly rather than as it may pertain to one particular application that may have come before the commission. Um, I'd be happy to answer any questions you may have. I hope that helps to guide you in your process. Thank you, Mr. Isbrin. Uh, since there's no one else signing up, uh, let's get out of uh, uh, the uh, public hearing mode, get into the other, and then if you'll stay close, sir, I would appreciate it. Okay, uh, since there's no one else signed up to speak, uh, on this matter, what we'll do is we'll close this public hearing, and it is now... 7 19.
So this public hearing is closed. <clears throat> and uh, with the matter on the table, oh, sorry. Okay, shut the timer off. Okay, uh, with this matter on the table, do I have a motion to, or should I go ahead and read this again, Mr. Brennan, so they'll know what the motion is? I don't think you need to read it again, Mayor, just whatever motion somebody wants to make. All right. So do I have a motion to move this forward? Mr. Mayor, I'd like to make a motion that we postpone consideration of this until it goes back to the Zoning Commission and they can, can adequately vet out ad additional language. I think we've got several good comments from Mr. Isbrand and from Mr. Brennan and Mrs. Ackley and other citizens regarding language, and I feel like there are too many variables to be considered for us to make a decision about language up here at the dais tonight. So my mo yeah. And I second that, also with the comment that we have a zoning commission for a reason, and they have expressed that they would like to support possible alternative language, and I feel that we should, I second it because I feel we should give them the opportunity to do so. Um, they have some very, very good points when you're dealing with children two to six, and it, it falls into the daycare category. So I make a second to motion that. We have a motion and we have a second on the table. Now we're gonna go into discussion. Douglas. What is the date certain that this will reappear? If it does. Does anybody know when the next uh, zoning meeting is? June 5th, June 5th. Was, the, was the date stated, our, and our next council meeting is June 12th, as far as a, a voting council meeting. Our meeting on the fourth Tuesday is a workshop. Thank you. Frank? Well, I, I, <laughs> I'm conflicted on this. I agree that it would be a good fit, but I realize if we do something to accommodate just one situation, like was mentioned by Mr. Isbrand, then we open the door with if uh, the school leaves. I'm all in favor of having the school there, and if there's any way that we could expedite, and Mr. Brand, I don't know if they can call a, like, like council can, call a special meeting, but there's too many variables on how to do this wording, and once we do it, 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 it needs to stick. So how do we get that done as expeditiously as possible? I don't think anybody up here is against the school. It's just making sure that we close the doors. Uh, is that a question for me? <laughs> no, it was for Mr. Brennan. Uh, <laughs> no, is there any way that, that the uh, uh, zoning can uh, call a special meeting if they need to or, or whatever to try to close the time frame on this to try to help the people who want to come into the city, don't want to be negative against it, but we need to make sure it's, it's done properly. And uh, like I said, I don't think there's anybody up here that's against the school coming in there, but if we do A, we affect B, and that's what we have to be careful of. Certainly. Uh, yes, the, the Zoning Commission can have a special meeting. Uh, I think we'd have to have it out far enough to where they could give the proper publication. I think this would have to be republished or re-noticed uh, in the newspaper or, or however the notice period uh, is handled. So I assume you're looking at least a couple of weeks before they could reconvene. But is there a way they wouldn't have to pay additional fees for that, would they? Uh, yes, if I understand the action, y'all are re referring this case back to the, the Zoning Commission so for further consideration, so it, it wouldn't be a start of a new case, uh, but it, it, the notice part would have to be complied with, I, I assume at the expense of the city. Okay, thank you. No additional comments. Ms. Scott? Um, yes, I have nothing but excitement about poss the possibility of having the French school here, but I do think we need to stand behind our, our vote to continue to um, keep the wording as we worded it. And like I stated before, I don't have anything else to add other than we have a zoning commission for a purpose. 
and they would like, they're requesting in here for more time to get that language just right to make this a possibility without opening it up for um, other situations to come up that would not be ideal like this one um, has the potential to be. So, thank you. Mr. Trevino? Yes, sir, Mayor, thank you. Um, I would have to agree with uh, the rest of my colleagues and Mr. Isbrand. I feel like there's a bit of a dangerous precedent when we change the zoning with each case. Uh, it's not to say that I don't think the French school would be a great addition to the city of Castle Hills, but I'd like to make sure that we're not making accommodations with every application. I think that the rules should exist for a reason. Um, that being said, I do have a couple quick questions, mostly because this is probably my last time to ask them. <laughs> but uh, would the traffic rules still apply from basis regarding left turns onto Winston? Um, that would have to, that's something y'all would have to decide. I assume when you, uh, if there is a change in the code to where this school could come to the city, so to speak, uh, y'all still will have to consider the SUP and uh, the SUP is where you make all the rules uh, and regulations and I assume that that would probably be one that y'all would consider a, a continuation of. Okay, Mr. Renner, well, I'll trust that you'll bring that up when the time comes if it does. <laughs> all right. Uh, and the other one would be that obviously I don't think this would trigger the traffic impact analysis uh, standard, which is I believe 150 cars uh, for traffic. But my question for you, Mr. Brennan, is how does that work seeing as the school plans to slowly grow to almost four times their size? I mean, at what point does that become an issue? Just educating myself. Well. Uh, it's back to the same thing. That's a consideration you'll have to make if you all consider an SUP. Uh, uh, the future growth of the school as well as its present uh, size uh, and, and what traffic issues might arise, as Ms. Winger said. Yes, sir. Thank you. Mr. Mott, uh, what did you say the times were the time frames were as far as uh, putting this together as far as your students to be able to uh, telling parents and everything for the school to move forward. What's the deadline? As you know, all parents are making decisions already in January, February for schools, and we've been in uh, contact with our parents, and we keep telling about uh, the pot potential location since January, but um, so every month we are basically losing parents because they need to sure. make sure their uh, children are in school in August. So for us, if we uh, delay this until June, and, and everyone is uh, traveling in summer, so parents will, will probably won't even reach them. So for us, it's really critical. The timing, it's, it's really jeopardizing our, our business sure. and school. But your so school starts in September, is that correct? It, it starts August 27th. Um, so, okay, I yeah, understand. So for us, this, this is... The, 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 this, the, the school will be following the calendar of Northeast Independent School District. Okay, so, so it'd be it August will, 20. It will be starting at, uh, toward the end of August. Okay. And as an organization that hosted an informational meeting for prospective parents, sure. Uh, and as a parent myself, you want to know that the school is on a solid foundation, that it has a facility, gotcha. so that you don't sign up for something and pay a registration fee only to find out it's not going to happen this year. Understand. You'll have to wait another year. So I understand. I, after last um, week's uh, hearing, I advised the school to begin to look for alternatives. If this pushes beyond uh, first week of June, um, they will have to move to an alternative location uh, or jeopardize the entire academic year. Thank you, sir. Thank, Thank you. you. 
say, make a couple of comments on this. First of all, I'm proud of the way that the school went to the residents first. I think this is the first time ever that anything has happened on that property over there where the school has organized itself without any help from city or anything else and went to these people in order to uh, uh, meet with the uh, leaders of that area. Uh, and I didn't have anything to do with that, believe it or not. I know it's all about me, but I didn't have a thing to do with that. And by uh, contacting these residents on their own, uh, I, I, think, I think we're doing the school a disservice is what we're doing. Mr. Brennan, there is no work around in order to get this done. This reminds me of a prisoner exchange on the South Korean, North Korean border. Something needs to be changed and we're gonna exchange prisoners here. Can we do this after the fact or do anything at all in order to make this work for them? Tonight. Well, that was, my, that was why I came up with this suggested wording. And Dr. Ackley's suggestion to get rid of the words that I use of day, day nursery uh, just to limit the possible authorization to preschool or kindergartens, you know, on a property that is on one of these uh, corridors would, would get you there uh, for the code. They're still going to have to go to a PNZ meeting. If you all did make that change in the code tonight, they still will have to go to a PNZ meeting to apply for the SUP and come back here for a final approval of the SUP. Uh, okay. In the That's alternative, Mayor, uh, at the next meeting of the PNZ, if, if wording could be uh, approved by the PNZ, they could also simultaneously recommend approval of the SUP based on that wording and move it back up to, for your consideration at the next it's meeting. Too late. No, it's not. It's too late. Well, okay. It could All right. Be well, with that said, then you're going to get, excuse me. I'm sorry. I have a question. Where is the alternative wording written? Right here. I'm sorry. I, so I just, we don't have a copy of no, that. that digging it, and digging for your alternative wording. Is it? It's we don't not, have it's not the in there. I just wording. worked on it today and brought it with me. I, I'd be happy to read it again if that would help anybody. But it's, it, it essentially what it says is there can be a preschool or a kindergarten on a property uh, with which the facility that it's in fronts on the commercial corridors of Northwest Military Highway or West Avenue. That's, that's the guts of it. Okay. Uh, just have a couple more comments. Uh, Kata and Michelle, I want to thank you for, for going to the residents. That's something that nobody has ever done in the, that I know of, and I've only lived here 64 years, uh, to, to, to get yourself aligned with the community. And, and thus, uh, from what I understand, and I could be wrong, the residents over there accepted that as a, uh, as a smooth alternative, at least the ones, the ones that I talked to. Unfortunately, there are boundaries that we have to live by, and it doesn't look like that there's an impasse in order to get it done in the time frame that you do. I'm sorry that it's going to hurt the economic impact of our city with the first time ever having a school that was going to buy from a restaurant in our city. By lunches, by breakfasts, by everything else. This is going to be a very, very unique situation. So with that said, I guess we're going to move forward with the motion in the second that Ms. McLean and Ms. Scott did, and uh, this is going to be a roll call vote, please. Can I ask for Mr. Brennan another question? Would you repeat your last recommendation, or uh, maybe it wasn't a recommendation, but your last suggestion that could also expedite it back to zoning and come this way? Uh, the suggested wording was a new section, a subsection A6, and this doesn't touch the word existing, it leaves it in place for the uh, prior section, but it says a preschool or kindergarten located on a property for which the primary entrance to the nursery, um, to the, take out nursery, to the preschool or kindergarten facility fronts on the commercial corridors of Northwest Military Highway or West Avenue. Uh, would be authorized to seek an SUP uh, for a school or kindergarten. 
Mr. Mayor, I'd like to have a comment on this. Sure. I uh, agree with Mrs. McLynn that this should be brought forth at a future time. After we, I, I think we can rush through something and regret it later. And um, I'm agreeing with the motion to withhold okay. this for the future. Also, Although, I hope the French school will reconsider if they can't do it right now. They might want to reconsider it next year. But if not, fully understand. Mr. Mayor, I have a couple comments if Mr. Gregory is finished. Um, I would like to amend my motion that if the Zoning Commission is able to have a meeting before the 5th of June and they're able to push it up to help with the timing of this, that the motion would be to postpone our decision until after they meet instead of mentioning the date certain of June 5th. And that way we are open if, if the stars align and they can meet earlier and we can discuss this earlier. I would, I would love it. But even with Mr. Brennan's language proposal, I still think there are some problems. Just taking out existing does not fix this. And just adding those commercial corridors, I don't think addresses the problems that we have all, that we were concerned about when we added the language. Mr. Brennan, why, uh, if this, they went ahead and moved forward on this, why couldn't we do this in a special meeting right after that, three days from today? Well, you're going to have to re-notice this whole uh, uh, process, uh, uh, which means the public, and I don't remember exactly what the day publication is. I don't know many if you remember what the publication minimum is, but you're going to have to re-notice this thing. Now, one thing I have seen done that you might consider is stacking the city council meeting with the PNZ meet or the zoning commission meeting to where there's a zoning commission meeting at you know six o'clock or seven o'clock look at all this make a decision and recommendation and then at seven o'clock have the city council meeting to take it up and finish it so you know you could do that in a couple of weeks probably if necessary and how much would that cost them in order to do that to run this back through it's the same it's the same thing if we're pushing it back to zoning they don't have to file any new paperwork it's the same action yeah, it, the only thing extra cost is going to be the publication in the newspaper and I, frankly I don't know how much that is okay that there did any time schedule mr. Mott of what you're thinking about Um, can I clarify your motion, Ms. McClinn, that you're changing the motion to modify Add an it, amendment, amendment to the motion. The amendment to the motion so that we can call a special meeting and as Mr. Brennan is saying, stack them so we have zoning followed by city council so we can expedite this a little bit faster to help the school out so um, this can be resolved in a, in a faster, more timely manner. I do think it just needs a little bit more time. So um, am I correct in understanding that's what you're saying? Ms. Yes, Brennan? I was taking out the date limitations. Take so out the date limitations. Mm -hmm. So um, amending our amendment to let's have a special meeting on this as quickly as possible to get it resolved. Who approves those meetings? Does the chairman call the meeting or does the mayor call the meeting? I, I th theoretically, I think the chairman of the, the zoning commission uh, uh, at least cons consents or agrees to the timing that usually the staff schedules that stuff, you know, based on publication deadlines. And Joe, would you consider moving that uh, zoning meeting up in order to facilitate the time frame? I think I would uh, have to ask Mr. Brennan for his counsel on that. Mr. Brennan, we announced at the meeting on May 1st that this matter would come back before the zoning commission at its June 5th meeting. So we have established that publicly as the date. Is that an issue then to change that date? I, I don't think so, but that's why we've got to re-notice the public yes, that sir. there has been a change in the scheduling. Yes, sir. That would, be, that would I mean, we're, as we've indicated, the commission is, you know, happy to deliberate this and we do think it deserves deliberation. So what would be in the best interest of the city, we're happy to do. Thank you, Joe. Okay, so it sounds like there's an amendment on the table to uh, expedite this as soon as, go ahead. To expedite this as soon as possible? Yes, correct. that is correct. 
There's an amendment on the table to expedite this as soon as possible. Uh, do I have a motion? It's, it seems to me as soon as possible is awfully vague. Uh, I'd well, like a date certain. Okay, well, how about tomorrow? Legally. Mr. Brennan has already stated that there are certain publication deadlines, and so subject to what the law requires us to do, that would be the soon as possible. So that, soon that's as very as good. That's possible. correct. <laughs> would be, can we post notice in the newspaper tomorrow for the next possible date? Like, go ahead and, or the next possible publication date for the newspaper. Yes. Post it, whether it's tomorrow or the next day, when it, when it can be put in to be published in the Express News. Yes. To have it put in at the next earliest possible date to be published, publication, and then whatever the date is following publication, that would be the date for the meeting, for the new yes, zoning meeting, stack it with the city council special meeting, and get that done. How about any time, I mean, if you want a specific date, how about any time after May the 8th at 10 o'clock? As soon as the law allows, let's just, uh, or the process allows, let's just do that and go on with it. Is that your motion, Ms. McGlynn? Yes, that is my motion, so I guess we need a second. Do you have a second for that motion? I will gladly second it. Okay, so we have a motion, we have a second, all in favor? All opposed? Okay. Motion wins over. We now have them. Uh, that that kind of took care of everything. Yeah, you don't have to go back to the original motion now. Okay, thank you. All right, moving forward. Uh, ladies, what we're going to do is we're as soon as possible, the law allows, we're going to go ahead and move uh, to go ahead and notify the public that we're making a change. The chairman of the uh, zoning has agreed as soon as uh, that the law allows that we are going to make that and then you'll be able to come back at uh, uh, if it's done in the morning or, or whatever it comes back uh, what is it two weeks? About two weeks about two weeks okay which should which should at least give you plenty of of time to do whatever it is that that you would like to do and uh, that's the best we can do at this time okay all right Moving along, let's go back to item number one, which is presentation and acceptance of the fiscal year 2017 audit and uh, annual financial report prepared by Armstrong, Vaughn, and Associates. Um, Debbie? Good evening. Um, I would like to start by thanking everybody that was involved this year. This was a little um, more difficult year. Laura and Nora both worked very hard to um, get information for us and um, get everything in a timely manner. So I'd like to thank both of them, as well as all the other city staff that we inevitably bothered. So you did receive an unmodified opinion, and that is on page one of the financial statements. And that, what that means, after adjustments, your financial statements are fairly stated and materially correct. If you turn to page 13, this is the balance sheet. And in past years, we've discussed this, this way? Okay. In past years, we've discussed your financial statements are shown several ways. You're shown, you show full accrual statements, which means that you see your financial statements with debt, fixed assets, compensated absence, and um, uh, pension liability. Whereas on the modified accrual, which is the way you budget, you don't see those fixed assets on the financial statements you don't see the pension liability. You only see what current resources you've spent and received. So we're gonna go over the financial statements on page 13, which is the way you budget again. So you had two major funds, your general fund and your street fu repair fund. Your total non-majors are um, collapsed in the back of the report. You ended the year with 8.4 million in assets. Of that, 
5.2 million was cash and cash, uh, cash equivalents, and another almost 9 million were your investments. You had liabilities of 225,777. Again, remember, this is your current liabilities. You had unavailable property tax revenue of 197,000 compared to the property taxes levied for future periods of 3.4 million. So at the end of the day, you had 4.6 million in fund balance. Of that, almost 3.3 million is unassigned. So you have that available in the next years. And remember, you assign or try to keep your um, unassigned fund balance at approximately six months. So you do have unassigned fund balance of over uh, approximately six months. You did increase your street maintenance by 36,000 or your available for street maintenance. If you notice, one of the assigned um, for major vehicle purchases went down because you did purchase a um, fire truck during the course of the year. So you had saved $500,000 or over 500, you had actually had 636,000, but that 500,000 was spent this year so we reduced the um, assignment for major funds. Well, I'm sorry, Debbie. Uh, would you repeat that again as far as the fire truck was concerned? I, yes. I, I didn't catch that. You purchased a fire truck at, in the last fiscal year. Right. So um, that was, you had an assignment of $636,000 of your fund balance in the prior years. And so 500000 of that we reduced for that major purchase of the I got it. Okay. Any Thank questions you. on that? Okay. What is an unavailable property tax revenue? That's your property tax revenues that you budget for or you assess in um, that become assessed October 1st. And I'll just use the year last year, 2017. And then they're available for spending um, according to your budget. January 1st, 2018. This, of course, would be um, exactly that, using those dates. All right, thank you. Okay. So I'd like you um, to turn to page 15. These are the statement of revenues and expenditures. On the major fund, um, you know what, it might be better if you turn back to um, the comparative uh, budget to actual on page 35. So this is your schedule of revenues and expenditures and changes in fund balance on page 35 and you see your original and final budget and then your actual amounts. So your total revenues were 6.6, .6, little over 6.6 .6 million you had total expenditures of 7.7 .7 million. So you had overspent by about 1 million, but then you had proceeds from your capital lease. So you signed a lease um, during 17 for the remaining balance of that um, fire truck and you have to recognize it because it's a current resource um, under modified accrual. So your total other financing sources were 552,424. So you had a net change in fund balance of a negative amount of 490, 489,000. But I do want to point out that that 500,000 that you um, spent, you had actually saved for in your future major equipment, um, that 500,000 that I just told you about. Um, the, other, the other item that you um, had kind of gone over on that we saw in the minutes was your streets. You had um, had some street and sanitation kind of a partnership with SAWS and um, you did go over in that category uh, your contract change orders for maybe um, gutters and curbing. Can we make that clear on what that was? I mean, we're not going to go item per item. What was the dollar amount of the change orders? Uh, I think they amounted to about $200,000, 236 maybe. Okay, um, all right. I can't remember the exact amount off 
off the top of my head, but I okay. know you discussed it in um, some of your minutes in December of 2017. Oh, is that paid to SAWS? Is that who that was paid no, to? No, it was paid to the con you had you had some overruns, um, so there was a combination. Okay. Aaron, I, I believe sure. those were the curves on Danube. Yes, sir. Okay, thank you. I so think we fought that battle, so. Okay. We don't need to refight the battle of San Jacinto. <laughs> I'm just letting you know that that's where, you know, your budget thank could you. go over a little bit, so. Okay. Um, on the next page, 36, is uh, your schedule of revenues and expenditures compared to your street revenue or street repair fund. And again, this is, these are repairs only. So your sales tax and total revenues license agreements um, were 296,000, and you actually had uh, total expenditures of 225,000. So you were left with a positive net change in fund balance um, during the year. On page 38, um, just want to go over this again. This is your net pension liability and the related ratios. Um, sure, you don't remember last year, but we kind of had an anomaly last year with um, the 2015 investment um, earnings going down so low. Um, if you look midway down the page on 38, you'll see net investment income and it was 745,000 in 2014, and it dipped to 20,251 in um, 15, and then it's back up to 932,351. And that's due to changes in assumptions and assumptions about the investments. Um, you are 86.56% funded at the end of the year. GFOA says anything over 70% is very good. So, so you're doing very good there. Excuse me, Debbie. Yes, sir. Why don't we have this for sh that same page on 38? Why don't we have for 2017? Uh, because that's based on the, the calendar year of CC and our TMRS. Okay. So remember that your um, pension liability is set by TMRS. Right. They give you the estimates, and so they're a year behind in their assumptions. Okay. They're Thank audited you. at the calendar year just like you are. So you'll expect next month to get your new um, 2017 information. Thank you. Okay. On page 41, this is comparative um, balance sheet. And I just want um, you to kind of look at that. And you can see, especially in your fund balance, um, some of the interesting items that occurred during the year. You had a, um, again, last year you had assigned 536,949 for a major purchase um, from vehicles and you, we did release 500,000 of that during the year. Your street maintenance commitment went from 599,176 to 635,602. Um, that occurred even as a result of uh, your increased spending in the streets. And then you had unassigned fund balance that went from three million last year up to 3.3 .3 million this year because your expenses increased, so that six month um, estimate also increased. Well, our liabilities went down uh, about a million dollars. If I'm reading it correct, at the bottom of 38. I'm sorry, I, I'll, I'll go back there. So on page 38, um, if we go back there, your net pension liability was two point, almost 2.3 million. Right. And um, it did increase about 100,000, 103,000. I was looking at the bottom pay, the bottom numbers on it saying total liability and deferred inflows of resources and fund balance, that was all. Oh, I'm sorry, on page 38, you're looking at. I'm sorry, 41. I'm, oh, okay. <laughs> These pages are running circles on me. <laughs> okay, thank you. Okay. So let me get this right, because we only, I only got this this evening. 
say, well, this is kind of well, My in understanding the is the PDF was in the package. The package. Um, so our pension liability is now $2,293,000. Is, is that a deferred compensation? Is that considered a deferred compensation? It's a combination of the two. There's a footnote, so it is a defined contribution plan. Yes, what sir. is our deferred compensation? Where is that number to be found? And, and what are what what deferred are you talking about? Compensated absences? Yeah, deferred. Are you thinking of a net pension liability? Yeah. Well, no, not not so much net pension, but a liability of not taking uh, working when, as opposed to having a holiday and not taking. Not and, deferring that compensation. Well, if you look at, um, I'll take you back to page 11. There's also a footnote in your financial statements, but if you go back to page 11, remember we do have the full accrual statements. Now the compensated absences don't show up on your modified accrual statements, only your full accrual statements. So if you look at page 11, you have um, compensated absences broken down into two areas. Um, due within one year of 73,657. This is and on page 11? Yes, sir. It's Okay, about, I got it. Okay, and then you also have long-term what's considered due in more than one year of 294,000. And there's a table in the notes um, that you can see. For a small town, do you believe it is healthy for a small town to have deferred compensation? Every town, every city has. I understand that, but I'm saying, do you think it's a healthy thing? I don't think it's unhealthy because you you accrue. That just means that people aren't retiring maybe from the city because that's usually when you see a lot of your compensated absences going down. Where you may want to be concerned is if you have um, compensated absences because they're working overtime and they're not salaried, and so they're receiving PTO um, based on that. So you may want to analyze that every year. For instance, your police officers um, have PTO, and, and we can send you the schedule of what that is. In your experience over the last recession, was there a spike of increasing of cashing in, cashing out of these deferred compensations in cities? No. There was not? No. no. Any other questions? Then I'd like to quickly go over the letters. Um, this year we did, That's good news. and I'm just gonna go over these lightly. Um, I wanna point out that we did um, have 27 journal entries, and there was a combination of journal entries, a little more than last year, but not many. Um, you had a considerable amount of journal entries, and then your bank recs weren't, um, uh, completely reconciled when we arrived. So I did consider that a material weakness. I do want to point out that some of the entries that we made went back to February of 2017, um, duplicate entries that had been made to the financials. Um, Would you repeat that again? Pull that mic a little bit closer to you, Bev, if you can. Oh, okay, sorry. Thank, thank you. Sorry. Would you um, repeat that again? About the 2017 February what? Um, you did have some entries that went back to about February 2017. Um, to, m to make up on what was needed to be done there as far as adjustments? Yes, sir. Okay. Yes, sir. Um, you also, again, hadn't reconciled your um, bank statements. However, as of to date, or as of the date of the report, was April 30th. You had reconciled through March, and um, right. Laura was quite um, effective at getting that done. We did have, uh, that was your material weakness letter, um, communications with those charged with governance is a separate letter and we break this down into several sections. We have the plan scope and timing and um, we completed that um, and what was originally communicated. Um, we were compliance with all ethics requirements regarding independence. Um, we had no disagreements with management, and I don't think they consulted any other CPAs. We consider that you have significant policies, and none of your policies significantly changed during the course of the year. 
We consider your significant accounting estimates to be the useful lives of depreciation or capital assets, the allowance for uncollectible receivables for property tax, and your net liability assumptions for mortality and investment returns. And again, the city has no, um, really not much control over the net pension liability assumptions for mortality. That's established by TMRS. We had no significant um, difficulties encountered during the audit. We consider the significant financial disclosures to be TMRS. Um, I, th I think that's one that you want to read and, and read carefully because it is a liability of the city and um, all the estimates are performed outside of the city. Um, uncorrected and corrected misstatements. We did not have any um, significant uncorrected misstatements. Um, we did request that um, Ryan and Nora and Laura sign a representation from management letter. Your public investment funds, this past year you did not approve an investment policy for 2017, nor did you, the investment officer sign off on the quarterly investment reports until we were here doing the audit. On page four, um, last year we had said that you had uh, internal control policy on GASB 68 had not been established. Um, review of employee census data had not occurred. Again, we still have that comment um, on the financial statements. And you might just want to consider um, just sending out a quick note to your employees and say, um, please go on uh, onto the website of TMRS and check your, your um, census data. We found in other cities where the person may have been born in um, 1936 and they had you down as age 36. Or um, you may be a female and they have you as a male. Now, you know, a lot of these, it would take a lot of these to um, change your financial statements or your financial pension liability significantly. But if the, con if the errors continue to occur, it could because naturally women um, are valued at age 85 or, or that's when their um, estimated death is and, and men only get 75. So, you know, you want to make sure that those, are, those estimates are correct and accurate. Um, last year, we had also written up that um, you had uh, statements that weren't appearing on your, fin on your financials, cash statements in particular. Um, we were made aware of the other day that you do have another um, cash account that has not been put on your financial statements. And I just want to encourage you that that is really important. And um, number one, the city's EIN number is on that. If there's theft that occurs in that account, you as council are probably held responsible. And it's really important to be able to see everything that the city has outstanding. So I'm gonna encourage that that um, be followed up with this year. Um, we, we became aware of a couple new opportunities to enhance your operations during the year. Um, you did not renew your letter of credit with Federal Home Loan Bank during the year. And so that covers your collateralization. Um, However, as of um, now, you've renewed that letter and your cash balances are fully, rec uh, fully collateralized. Uh, reconciliation of credit card receivable has not been regularly accomplished. As a result of um, that, you increased from 2,922 to 12,643. Although this is really immaterial to your financial statements, um, we, we hope that that's done. And again, um, it is now done through March 2018. Um, and it may be done through April. I had not discussed that um, before I came tonight. Um, the interim finance clerk had been performing both HR and payroll clerk duties without review from another key employee until December 2017. Um, what had happened is you had a control in place last year and um, kind of with the um, distribution of employees and people leaving, 
that failed to get done um, really most of last year. I think it was a control that um, your former city manager had kind of decided to, was not really necessary, so he, he kind of stopped doing it. Um, but again, that's been rectified as of March 2018. Um, I'm going to recommend also that uh, with your monthly financial statements that you start getting a balance sheet because that balance sheet is pretty important for you to, to be able to identify those cash accounts. And I guess the assumption has always been that you were receiving those balance sheets. Now we haven't done that in the past. You recommend that that's a procedure that we start? Yes. Correct, yes. thank you. Um, the city currently is using ASSIST. You know, it's a very antiquated program. I remember when you implemented it, um, you had bought it and didn't really implement it for a couple years because it was very difficult to use. Um, it's kind of the lower end of ENCODE, and at the time, you didn't have a lot of money to spend on um, uh, an accounting software. And like most governments and nonprofits, you know, the, the software, the accounting software is usually the last place you want to spend things. But um, you've grown in the number of transactions that you have, as well as the um, amount of uh, items that you know come from software that you have on ENCODE, such as uh, your police tickets or your municipal court. So um, right now, you're having to manually enter you know, a lot of data that if you went to one full system, it would upload um, a lot easier. And, and it just has a couple little flaws in it that are really difficult to, um, you know, manage. So I, we discussed this with um, your, your uh, county staff as well as your city manager and um, feel that you're probably at the point where you need to consider something that's uh, a little more robust. That's all I have. Do you have any questions for me? Uh, I do. Debbie, uh, how long will you plan to stick around this evening? There is an item on the agenda which I'd like your comments on uh, when we get into, which we cannot talk about now because it is on the agenda. Okay. Um, I, I can stick around. I do have to catch a flight at 5 a.m. So. Okay, so I'm going to move that item up okay. after we uh, finish this so we can go ahead and get you out of here in oh, time. Okay. Um, Mr. Trevino, did you have any thoughts or comments regarding Ms. Uh, Debbie's presentation, please? Uh, yes, sir, Mayor. Would you mind uh, skipping me for right now while I write a couple things down? I'm s oh, skip him for now. Sure, sure. Uh, Ms. Scott, did you have any uh, comments or presentation, uh, comments or questions for Ms. Debbie? Um, I just want to thank you for, it looks like, doing a very thorough job and pointing out in areas where we definitely look like we need improvement, things that didn't happen that should have happened. And um, I definitely appreciate that so this next year we can make those corrections so we don't have to follow, have the same mistakes happen again. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Uh, McLean, did you have any uh, comments or questions for Debbie? I have a few, or a few comments, I guess. Um, I do understand this one a lot better than last year's audit, um, and I suppose that's just having looked at one. Um, and I appreciate the comments to make our internal controls better. As I learned about some of the archaic accounting programs we were using, it really worried me as a, as a member of council sitting up here that there are a lot of opportunities for mistake or um, or problems, like real legitimate problems of fraud or other things that could come up with some of the um, cumbersome the cumbersomeness of some of that. So I appreciate the recommendations to tighten up some of that. Um, but I wanted to clarify because I know the budget ended up being a little bit skewed from what had been budgeted for the end of the year, but basically what the audit shows is that, that the major variances were because we ended up buying a fire truck early 
and we spent more on infrastructure needs in repairing some streets than we had intended to do. And so the major variations are in the budget are based on those two items, which... That's true. You did, you did um, buy the fire truck earlier, but I want to also point out that you had saved... Oh, I'm, I'm sorry. Um, yes, you did go over budget in the fire truck with the fire truck, but I want to point out that you had progressively sta saved over the years, and that 500000 that you saved and was in fund balance, you would never see in the financial statements because it's fund balance. So it's not going to show up as part of revenue nor um, part of expense because it's just moved from your fund balance. That's why the fund balance decreased. So although it wasn't Planned, you did. You had planned progressively to buy a major piece of equipment over the course of um, four or five years. Okay, very good. And then the other thing, I know that last year we had a large discussion about the amount of reserves that we have, and we're still at that six that six month mark, you, and so we're well. You, yes, you are. Sa we've saved well for that catastrophic day that you would need that. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. McLean. Mr. Paul, did you have any? Uh, well, I want to make it easy just to bottom line it. Uh, we don't see any major exceptions, the things to the financial statement, uh, mainly because we don't use a reserve for saving our money for the fire truck, so you have to take that out of a direct cash. It's not like having a business financial statement, if I'm understanding, and I've had to understand a little bit of this over the past couple of years. So am I pretty much on you're, target? You're true. I, I mean, you're, you're, you're on track. I know the, the question was that capital lease. I'm showing that right. as proceeds. Well, governmental accounting is a little different, and so it requires you, if you take out a lease or a loan, to recognize that in the current year that you <coughs> did. So, so that's what you're seeing. And yes, you, you had saved the cash, um, but you won't see it um, in revenue because you had saved it, and it rolls over into your fund balance. Well, and the last thing I have about the audit is I uh, read thoroughly Mr. Um, uh, Rapley's uh, letter, and it seemed to me like it was pretty involved in, in, and addressed all the issues that we need to do that we maybe haven't done in the past. And I would just want to know your comment on that letter. Did you feel it was adequate for your audits and uh, for the future, what we want to put in place? Um. His letter that he wrote on what we're doing, our recommendations, or did you present that to her? Uh, no, Councilman Paul. That it was in the, it's in the backup for the encode item. It wasn't necessarily okay uh, for the audit per se. Uh, I didn't have right. To, okay, Ms. I thought you addressed it, it to uh, to the accounting firm itself, though. Uh, yeah, you did, but okay. Uh, he addressed the issues. He addressed the issues we faced. And main thing is, is we got everything reconciled and ready to go, including our special funds as of uh, March, the end of March, right? Yes, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Paul. Mr. Gregory. And on what page do we find the net for the year? The net for what? For the city for the year. Um, well, you can find it in several places. Do you want to see full accrual or do you want to see modified accrual? Full. Full. Okay, if you see, if you look on page 12, this is your full accrual. So you had a change or an increase in net position of 370,140. Um, and then that increased your net position from almost 10.4 million to 10.7. Remember, this is all your funds um, added together basically and shown on the full accrual with all your compensated absences, debt, fixed assets. And if you wanted to see it just for the general fund, okay. then you would want to um, look on page 15 and you would see that net change in fund balance of a negative 489,000. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Gregory. Okay. Mayor, may I ask a couple questions now? Of course. Okay. Um, first of all, I just wanted to thank you for pointing out the uh, what is it? Material weaknesses and uh, internal controls. That's something that uh, Mr. Rapley had brought forward to us as well, and I'm glad to hear that y'all on the same page. And I have faith that he'll be able to get that straightened out to avoid any problems. Unfortunately, I, I believe that we've been lucky so far. Um, 
you kind of winced a little bit when you said uh, 27 journal entries. Is that a lot? I, I don't understand um, what the standard is. Well, uh, you probably, uh, you, it's more than you've had in the past, but I do want to point out that um, two, three of them were given to me by um, Laura, and she came in and reconciled your cash, which did have a significant adjustment to it. Um, I'm not, I, I, when I say that many journal entries, I did want to make sure that you understood that it was entries that probably should have been made over the course of the year, not just your ending balances. Got you. Um, the investment officer is the treasurer? Yes, sir. Okay. Um, and I'm assuming that we talked about uh, the an antiquated software. It's my understanding that the data has to be manually transposed? There, there's a lot of data that has to be um, taken from, for instance, your municipal court system and put in, same with permits, um, and put in directly into the system by journal entry. Um, another, uh, just you have, it's, it's not, it's probably what you would consider maybe um, a, a larger corporation operating on QuickBooks or something similar like that. So in your professional opinion, you would probably recommend that we upgrade to a, a software that fits our size? Car careful, Mr. Uh, yeah. Trevino, just asking careful. A, just asking an opinion, sir, sorry. I, I do think that, um, I mean, it's been a discussion um, every year with your city managers and um, your city staff, so it's, it's not a new one. Um, from my perspective, sure. Um, I will tell you that when you went to, uh, when we came on board, um, you were on QuickBooks, but you had purchased a CIS. Uh, with all due respect, I think we ought to hold on that conversation until okay. we get into the uh, item on the agenda. Okay. Uh, thank you, Mr. Trevino, for uh, your edging around that, I guess. Or anyone else okay so let's uh, was there anything else you had uh, or JR no sir that's it okay thank you all right let's uh, move forward Debbie like I said as soon as we we finish running this through the gambit uh, we will I'll get you out of here as soon as possible we'll move the item up on the agenda that pertains to that particular item and uh, we'll go from there Okay, let's, uh, let's see, where are we? We are, okay, we got that. Okay, so let's do this. Let's get a, um, a motion. Let's get a second, and then uh, hopefully we'll skirt by some discussion here since we've already done this and get into the public portion of this. So uh, let's, may I have a, a, a motion please? So moved. Thank you. Do I have a second? Okay, we have a motion from Mr. Trevino, second by Mr. Paul. Uh, this goes into the discussion part of ours since we've already had questions and answered. Did you have anything to add, Mr. Trevino? No, sir, Mayor. Thank you very much. Ms. Scott, thank you. Ms. McLean, thank you. Mr. Paul. Mr. Gregory, at this time, did you have any comments, please? Could you give us the major, one major recommendation that we should do in the future, beginning now? Reconcile your bank statements monthly. On a monthly basis? Yes. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Gregory. Okay, we have... Uh, what? We don't have anybody signed up for this. Hang on, let me make sure. We're not... We don't have anybody signed up for this. Wow. Okay. So let's go ahead and uh, hold on just for a second. Okay. Uh, with that said, let's go ahead and uh, we have a motion. We have a second on the table. All in favor of this? It is unanimous. Thank you very much. Let's move on. Thank you, Debbie. Uh, we're going to move up item number... Uh, three to the uh, next and what that is is consider and act upon ordinance number 2018-05-08-A 
amending fiscal year 2018 budget to purchase the ENCODE finance and personal management module, an integrated government software from Tyler Technologies in the amount not to exceed $31,500 and authorize the city manager to sign the, the agreement. Mr. Rapley. Thank you, Mayor. Um, as a result of this, um, actually segueing from the, the audit by Ms. Frazier, um, uh, this is good timing, obviously, to bring this agenda item for uh, discussion and action, possibly uh, by you as council. Uh, being here for the last uh, few months and working um, with uh, and preparing this audit with Ms. Frazier and, and Laura Feegan. And, and um, let, me, let me just give you some background too, and so all of y'all from council know this is, this is Laura Feegan, and um, she actually came at the recommendation of Ms. Frazier early on when I came into this role. Um, she's uh, spent uh, the last four years as finance director of Chavano Park, been finance director with other cities for different cities for over 15 years. Um, she's done a great job, obviously, as Debbie had mentioned, that she's helped reconcile, evaluate some accounting practice, and helped me, myself, craft uh, the memo I wrote, particularly when we're examining the different modules and how ASSIST works with those current modules we have in place. Um, so if you have any questions, um, please let me know, um, and our Laura is here to answer those questions. Um, again, as you heard from Ms. Frazier, the idea was bringing this forward uh, to centralize our financial software with our permitting and municipal court, which again is already using ENCODE, so we thought about the best idea to integrate and interface this. Um, so we tried to reduce and minimize errors or, or have the city susceptible to any fraud moving forward. Thank you, Mr. Rapley. Uh, I wanted to, before we We'll get a motion, we'll get a second on the table to move this forward and then we'll go into discussion. Before we get started on this, I wanna remind everybody that anything that's said tonight is not to single out any previous, any previous financial officer or anybody who had touched the books up to this time. It's not to point out any previous or financial officer who touched the books up to this time. These are recommendations made by not only uh, people who have come in and found some errors that had been going on back several years to uh, easier ways to do things and, and uh, more uh, computer software driven avenues to stop mistakes. Okay, with that said, do I have a motion to move this forward? Mr. Mayor, I have a motion that in as much as this is going to be a consideration of $100,000 approximately over five years, I move we move this consideration of this agenda item to the next council meeting in the first, in the next month of June. Okay, we have a motion on the table from Mr. Gregory. Do I have a second for that motion? Mr. Gregory, will you repeat your motion, please? In as much as this expenditure is a major expenditure of approximately $100,000, I move that we move the consideration of this item to the first city council meeting in June. I will ask the council again, do I have a second for this motion, please? One last time, motion dies for lack of second. Can I okay. say something, Mr. Mayor? Yes. I guess it kind of bothers me a little bit that Councilman Gregory doesn't think we're smart enough to talk about this and work on it ourselves. That's what we're here for, that the citizen put us here for, and we're gonna do our uh, job. Thank, thank you. you, Mr. Paul. Can we wait, uh, let's, you'll be able to, in discussion, be able to uh, talk, uh, speak to that. So with that said, do I have a motion for this item to move forward, please? So moved. Thank you, Mr. Vigno. Uh, second? Second. Thank you, Ms. McGlynn. Okay, we have a motion, we have a second on the table. Uh, we are gonna move forward. Uh, Mr. Trevino, did you have any comments regarding this? And I would like to steer any questions that have to do with Ms. Uh, 
Debbie there quickly so she can get out of here for her plane flight tomorrow at 5 a.m. Yes, sir, Mayor. Would it be uh, appropriate to follow up on the question that I was asking earlier regarding her professional opinion? As Captain Kirk would say, so moved. <laughs> Ms. Frazier? <laughs> I'm just gonna say that yes, I, we work with ENCODE. We think it's a very good system. We work with ENCODE or cities that have ENCODE. We, um, we prepare audits for about 28 cities and a couple counties that um, are on ENCODE. And um, it's very important to integrate it because sometimes, I mean, you know, every, anytime there's human um, capacity, there's always room for some errors to occur. There, it also is much more robust in your bank reconciliations um, and, and in your um, check, check writing. So you have just a completely more robust system and you, are, you have grown. Uh, you, you just need to maybe consider, if not ENCODE, another, another type of accounting system that would be much more robust for a city this size. I would imagine that the integration would probably lessen the load on whoever's having to input the data. Absolutely, absolutely. So the way that I see it, it would probably end up saving some money administratively on the labor side. I, mean, I don't want to quantify a number, but I imagine there would be a savings. It should be, yes. And there would also be the reduction for possible errors. Yes. Okay, thank you, ma'am. Miss uh, Scott, did you have any questions for Miss um, Debbie? Okay, thank you at this time. Miss uh, McLean. I don't have any questions for you about this issue. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Paul? I don't have any questions, but I just want to be elementary for some people that may not be up on what we're really talking about. To me, the city's a corporation. We have five departments. And right now, these departments, each one have transactions within them. Some of these departments are not integrated to the central computer where the finance office is. And a lot of the information for department A has to be manually transcripted and put in at the computer in the finance office. And it takes a lot of time and a lot of duplication can happen, a lot of errors of potential. So it's just like a company saying, we're growing, we need a little bigger computer system to make sure we are integrated. And this system will integrate all these five departments so that the parts department or the uh, fire department burps over there, it'll show up over here without coming through a piece of paper. Am I correct there? Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Paul. Mr. Gregory, do you have any comments for Ms. Debbie, please? What is the single most benefit to Castle Hills if we purchase ENCODE? The single most benefit. I don't think you can quantify that to one benefit. Um, I think there's uh, quite a few. It's, it's, you and I, I believe are a business owner, I'm a business owner, and you know, every couple years or every five or 10 years, I have to look at you know, the new accounting software that's out there, but also the new auditing software, as well as, um, you know, what technology is there and, and how my company's grown. We've grown from, you know, 2003 having eight employees. So I don't do payroll for my company anymore. I, I have the ADP. So I think you have to assess a bunch of different items that have occurred over the past years. The number of permits you're now doing, the number of tickets you're getting, um, the amount of payroll you're performing. So I think there's a lot of um, things that you have to consider. If you remember about five years ago, I recommended that you look into ADP because mm -hmm. you, you had so many um, issues with your payroll at that time. So I think you have to assess what's um, important, but also look at how you've grown and how a system may, or you may need to adapt to a new system. Is there a way to quantify whether the $100,000 we were put into this system 
brings back to the city a benefit of at least a hundred thousand dollars i don't think you can i mean you know accounting is usually the place that or software for accounting is usually the place that you look at last because you don't want to spend money there i mean that's not typical of this city it's or atypical it's typical of a lot of cities you know it's a huge investment i understand that but it's also to ensure that you're getting accurate reports. So, I, you know, you, I don't think there's a way to quantify the $100,000, no. Last year notwithstanding, if you go back two or three years prior to this, when we weren't using ENCODE, would you have recommended ENCODE three, two or three years ago? I think we discussed it two or three years ago. I think we discussed it early on quite a bit. Um, I know I discussed it with the former mayor um, several times because your transition was very, very rocky. Because I know ENCODE has, been, has come into this city about 12, 15 years ago. It started here and then there. It's sort of like an octopus. It's slowly well, it's, uh, taking over one department after another. You mean the city of Castle Hills? Mm -hmm. yeah. And yeah. the Crime Control Prevention District, they, they, I remember they offered something for an enormous price that said it was just absolutely we had to have, and they turned it down. Okay, I'm... I'm well, you thank have, you. You have different funds, so the, you know, your crime control uh, is on your, on a fund in, within your um, financial statement, so it would be on ENCODE as well as it, it currently is on ASSIST. Thank you. Debbie, I have a few questions for you here. Um, all major corporations, no matter what it is, small, large, anything, are, are moving to computer-based platforms, whether it be um, salesforce.com, whether it be whatever, whatever it might be. Is that a fact or not a fact? There are, I mean, you still have cities that aren't on the computer the platform okay. and some that are. I but mean, they're on something like Assist or uh, even even to a small degree QuickBooks uh, Plus or Plus something. In other words, uh, what we were doing five years ago, who, who and what major entity over nine, ten million, nine million dollars would continue to do the books they way, the way they did five years ago? Well, a lot of people would not invest in um, accounting. I mean, we're not on the same system okay. as we were five years ago, but if that's the what? example you want to. But for instance, most of your cities around here are, were on ENCODE, and they've gone to better versions of ENCODE. So for instance, you know, you upgrade ENCODE, and they, they uh, specialize in that governmental software. So um, I, I guess I'm not sure what you're What I'm asking, asking is, this is what I'm getting to. We have a broken system here. You do. We have a broken system. We have systems all over this, all over this city that don't integrate, okay? And, and what ends up happening when you do that is you have to the mistakes and to the tune of three months ago. We had quite a few mistakes. Yes. And that went back several years, is that correct? There were, there were some that were kind of immaterial. I wouldn't say, uh, e there were a couple that went back several years, but they were immaterial to your financial statement. So the question I have is yes, this is a huge expense. There's, there's no doubt about it. But we have a broken system. We have a system that is acting like we did uh, five, 10 years ago and we, we have uh, physical input or manual input that can, that can make things happen that don't mesh with the million dollar tickets that we're, we're writing now, 900 and some odd thousand dollars. It's separate system than, the, than this particular system and you're having to manually move things. Why would anybody want to stay that way? I can't answer that. I mean, is it because of cost? Well, because, yes, you would. That that's going to be your biggest um, 
tampering, I mean, your biggest hindrance. I mean, it's expensive okay. to move to ENCODE. Hang on, hang on. Okay. Could you tell me who are the competitors to ENCODE? Um, S STW is, an in, is a um, competitor and STWSWT, did I say that? STW. Um, they're, they're one of the comp competitors. They're not used in South Texas very, very much. Um, uh, it's more of, I would say, a Midwestern, uh, north of Dallas type of system. New World is another system that's out there. Um, it's very ro robust. It's mainly used by a county, uh, counties. Um, MIP is really geared to not, MIP. It's really geared to um, nonprofits, but I do have a county and a city that uh, have used it. It does not um, integrate well with, um, well, the, the cities that have it use ENCODE um, for permits and uh, different software for water. And I think they are going actually, or they're looking at going to ENCODE right now also because um, the way it's set up. Uh, MIP, and, and I love MIP. I worked for MIP for um, several years, so, um, but I don't think it's best geared to a city or a county. Okay. Do you think it's best for a city to be totally dependent upon one system? Yes, I do. You yes, do? I do. Hang on, I'm not through. So who is the largest in the industry when it comes to this type of, of software? Largest in the industry across the board. Well, it depends because you have different levels of cities. Um, you know, the city of San Antonio does not use ENCODE. Okay. But cities your size um, that we audit, uh, you know, we're talking 28 cities and except for, you know, cities like Santa Clara or, you know, c very small cities. And how many years have you been our auditor? I've been your auditor, I believe, for 10, but I've been auditing governmental entities for 30. 30, and you're 10 with us. So what is your recommendation as far as the city of Castle Hills being a 10-year auditor? I think you need to look at a more robust system. And okay. I think ENCODE is a very good system. And every city, almost every city around here uses ENCODE. So it's, you, it's easy to pick up the phone and call another city and say, I'm having this problem. Have you seen it before? So, um, and for that reason, I really like that. Okay, Ms. Scott. All right, um, I have a question. Um, if we continue to use assist, if we go on as says Ho, is it a true statement to say that there are multiple opportunities if we continue to use assist for fraud to go undetected? I don't, you know, I think if you have internal controls, good internal controls, bank recs are um, reconciled monthly. I think it's easier to, because of the type of system assist is. But I heard it's you weren't having them re reconciled monthly, so. Well, you, you were up until June of last year, but, um, you know, you, you didn't after that. Um, you did have to, you had a lady come in that I did recommend, right. and she did about two months. Um, but she wasn't familiar with ASSIST. Again, ASSIST is not used very much in this area or, mm -hmm. you know, I think there's maybe one other um, user. Okay, so, but, um, but, it's, but it's giving multiple it's more people access to our general ledger that probably yes. don't need access to the general That's ledger. True. That's true. Which does leave us open to possible fraudulent a, things happening undetected. It's more of a QuickBooks of accounting so of um, city software is what I would um, akin it to. Mm -hmm. But it is leaving us open for issues. You, you do have By issues, By continuing yes. under the same software yes. that we have now. Yes. Okay. An error. I, and I don't want to say fraud well, not per se. Well, I want to say errors. Say, but error, unintentional mm -hmm. error. Unintentional error, yes and Ms. possibly other issues. Ms. Debbie, I thank you for your prudence in, in talking about how far the books were off. Thank you. Mr. Trevino. Yes, sir. Uh, Mr. Gregory made a comment that kind of caught my attention. 
Where does the hundred thousand dollar investment come from? The total cost over a five year period that includes the initial cost and the annual cost as close to a hundred thousand dollars. Why five years? Because that's what the contract calls for. So it's three thousand a month. Is some of that is probably maintenance, right? The way it, it was the way it was written, there's a one time fee of thirty one thousand five hundred dollars, and then there's an annual fee for five years of thirteen thousand six hundred and two. And when you add it up, yeah. Me. It's $99,510 spread out over a six-year period. But that includes your maintenance, your upgrades, and everything else. So okay. it's not a purchase price type of thing. It's really a service and a maintenance and an ongoing fee. And the other problem is if you consider how much are we losing in time, how, many, how much inefficiency. It, it takes three times to do the same job that we could do on ENCODE. And it just, I, I don't know. It's, I don't know why we're questioning. We, um, Mr. Paul, uh, I was just going to say, if Laura can refer to that one as far as this, this five years locks us into that price, so it can't change over the next five years through ENCODE for anything related to maintenance or upgrades. Mr. May, I have more comments, but no more questions for Mrs. Frazier. Ms. Frazier, well. have a safe trip. Thank you. Mr. Gregory had asked about benefits earlier, and in my eyes, the biggest problem that I've seen and I've asked last year during the budget cycle if I could see the budget five years out, like forecast our budget five years out so I can tell if the decisions I'm making on the budget we adopted for this year is a good idea. And was told, no, we can't do that. And what I understand is that in assist, it is very, very difficult to use it in budgeting because you can't forecast out without doing it manually. So what my question was, how many hours were spent by staff last year putting together a budget that could have been done by pushing a button with ENCODE and we could have gone on to bigger and better and other business for the city instead of spending so many hours on the budget. So I see having budget forecast out into the future as a benefit to members of council in adopting budgets. I see being able to drill down to revenue and expenses so I can compare apples and apples and see what a particular expenses or what is in an expense or what is part of a revenue and see what, you know, one, th one thing that is a revenue on one side but has an expense to it, you can actually see what, you know, whether something is, is worth keeping in the budget, whether something is making the city money. I see employee efficiencies as a benefit, both budgeting and monthly, and I see reducing the opportunities for mistake, just simple mistakes with transposing numbers and malfeasance. Those are the benefits to me, and I think that that is absolutely worth $100,000 over a six-year period. Thank you. Mr. Douglas, Mr. Gregory, do you have any response to that, please? Or anything regarding moving forward? Well. <laughs> I remember when I was in law school, they were introducing a new thing called shepherdization. It was a computer that would zap up all the legal books on a screen when you punch in one word and you'd get all the cases. It's quick, it's one punch of a button, but a lot of lawyers would say <laughs> that what it does do is it eliminates the thought process of the person punching the button and you're relying on technology instead of the best computer you have is your own mind. I'm not, I'm, uh, I can see there are benefits to ENCODE. I'm not convinced though that ENCODE is the way to go at this time. I'm certainly not convinced about such an expenditure at this time. However, I am open for future uh, information that might change my mind. Uh, I don't, we are not, a, I find it very intriguing that San Antonio doesn't use ENCODE. If it was such a great program, why in the heck doesn't San Antonio use it? But that's neither here nor there. Well, it's not uh, let's there. answer that question. Why does San Antonio not use that? I, I participate in the city of San Antonio audit. You did what? I participate in the city of San Antonio audit annually, um, subcontractor. And they have a system that was built specifically for them. And how much was that system, Debbie? I can That's get you that figure um, because uh, we actually did the capital assets, but it's significant, like $15 million. Hmm. So, um, Not a good deal to me. 
So San Antonio built their own system? They had it built mm -hmm. um, by an outside firm, yes. A large city, Bakersfield. most large cities do. Um, Dallas, um, most, most cities, city of San Antonio size, don't use ENCODE. You know, ENCODE has their niche. Cities like Shirts use it, um, which, you know, have uh, quite a bit more going on than you, got, you currently do. All the way down to, um, you know, Hilotus uses it. Um, almost all the cities around here, uh, Almost Park, Hollywood, Hollywood. Um, Does yeah. Alamo Heights use it? Hmm? Does Alamo Heights use it? Uh, yes, they do. The lady that was helping here, um, that's what she used. Cynthia, she came from Alamo Heights. Um, so, yes, they, they use it. I do not believe Terrell Hills is using it. I think they're looking at it. Um, Converse, um, Silvo, uh, trying to think of all the cities we got it. Uh, Chavano Park, um, Burnham. Um, we don't audit them, though. Uh, Holotus, I said Holotus. Uh, Shirts, Universal City, Selma. Um, almost every city that is in this area, Wimberley. And the cost of this includes upgrades and maintenance. Hmm? The cost that we're expected to pin includes maintenance and upgrades over this period of time? Typically it does. Um, the contracts that I've seen when cities have um, switched, uh, Converse uses it and they switched um, and their system, uh, it, that's the last contract I read. Um, so that's the one I can think of. Um, they switched, uh, I think, four or five years ago. Okay. Thank you. Okay. All right. So um, let's move on to the portion. Uh, thank you, Debbie. Let's move on to the portion of uh, citizens to be heard on this agenda. Ms. Suzanne Riley. Thank you, Ms. Riley. Mr. Clyde McCormick. Clyde McCormick, 207 Carrollwood, here in Castle Hills. I respectfully ask the council to defer decision on this uh, project until the next council meeting for, for a couple of good reasons. First of all, the presentation was incomplete. The fact is that the contract calls for a five-year contract at 13502 per year plus $31,000 initial installation cost. That's true. But what isn't included in the contract and what isn't specified in the documents that we've received are two things that are very important. First of all, there's no timeline. We don't know how long it's going to take, and they won't determine that until the contract has been issued and they begin project development. So we won't know how long it'll take until then. We won't know how many people will be coming in or how long they'll be with us. The second thing we don't know is what it's gonna cost us for those people to travel and stay in San Antonio. If you look at uh, section B1 of the, of the attachments to the contract, you'll see their travel policies. But there are no numbers there that'll be useful for you in determining what it would cost anybody to come and stay with us. So we have a, a project that's going to be a fairly extensive project from looking at their contract. A lot of people will be coming in. There's a half dozen uh, project uh, governors from the company plus governors from the city that will be required to, to put together some kind of committee. So we have an undetermined period of time and an undetermined number of people who will be coming in to stay with us and an undetermined cost for that project. It could easily be thousands of dollars in excess of the number that we've got in this contract. So for that reason alone, it's worth deferring it to figure out what that is. We need some information from the company. We need some information from Mr. Rapley. We need some details on how long it will take them to do this and how many people will be here. There's no question but what we need, a really good finance system. No doubt about it. I don't know that this is the one, but whichever one we buy, we need to know what it's going to cost up front. We don't know that right now. And so for that reason, we need to take time and find out that, that particular piece of information, which is very important to us. Thanks for your consideration. Thank you, Mr. McCormick. George Booth. Mr. 
Mr. Mayor, Council, George Booth, 124 Dogwood. I'm a little alarmed tonight. You know, the agenda said it's going to cost $31,500. Now I'm learning it's going to be upward of $100,000. I feel we're deceived by the agenda of what was written. I don't think you all have adequately researched this, and I'm curious if other um, modules that we currently have are going to need upgrading. Is that part of this $100,000 fee, or are we going to have to buy something else? And I just don't feel that uh, you've adequately researched this. Thank you, George. Mr. That's it. Okay. Did council have any questions about what the citizen brought up? Excuse me. There's no public hearing. I have something. Okay, go ahead. Council is either approving or not approving to move ahead with NCOR. We aren't approving the contract. We haven't seen the contract. You have these costs that was just brought up by any computer system when they come in the excuse when they come into the city to put in a new computer system. I've been through two of them, and it's not something. It's a negotiable item, and that's something that the city manager and the attorney would work on with the contract. If I'm not mistaken, Mr. Brennan, we're not approving the contract. We're just approving to go ahead, right? To, to proceed with the contract. Yes, sir. You're authorizing the city manager to negotiate the contract. Thank you. Does that mean that the city manager will bring back to the council the contract for approval? Uh, I don't think that's the intention. I think the motion would be to uh, authorize the purchase of the system for the price stated and authorize the city manager to, to negotiate the contract. It doesn't necessarily have to come back. Thank you. Okay. Mr. Trevino, did you have any comments, please? Well, I uh, trust that Mr. Rapley would proceed with his experience and with Castle Hill's best interests in mind. It's my understanding that much of these uh, types of programs are fairly standard across the board, just given the fact that they're used everywhere, and I imagine the practices are standard across the board as such as well. Ms. Scott, did you have any comments, please? Well, we, we're agreeing to approve an amount not to exceed $31,500 in negotiation of this contract to purchase the ENCODE system. All of the other departments are on ENCODE, am I correct in that? With Municipal Court and Permitting. Municipal yes. Court, Permitting, Police Department? We are in other, other, other suites. From other the suites department. from the same Interact company. Interoperability does exist between that, them. That interact, okay. So, and, and that $31,500, that would include bringing the people in to set it up training, everything that I read in this extensive operation manual here, could you clarify that, that this cost does include bringing it in, setting it up, setting up the ASCII two files to switch it over and all of that sort of thing is included in this price? Yeah, the, the 31500 is for the one time for the implementation, for the purchase and implementation of the software. That gets um, us up and Now, running. they kind of gave us a, a time frame that that probably from an installment or implementation time frame, it wouldn't happen until more than likely later this year uh, from that standpoint, because they're about six months out working with other cities right now as far as uh, schedules and time frames for implementation. This year in the budget, we would have to pay the 31,500. Next year's budget is where we would schedule the first annual maintenance fee uh, as part of the first of the five years. Okay, so all of those costs are included in that $31,000. And, and, and as, as Councilman Trevino had mentioned in, in my experience, yes, that my, my last two cities I worked for were all integrated with ENCODE uh, from that standpoint. Uh, thank okay. you. Debbie, uh, I'm sorry, Ms. McLean, did you have any comments for the, uh, for the item, please? I had noticed the provisions that um, Mr. McCormick brought up about the cost of travel on those exhibits, and so 
that was a little interesting to me, and so those would just be things that I would want to clarify, but it doesn't change the idea that, that we need to do something, and we are on so many ENCODE programs right now, this makes sense to have the integration across the board in the city. So I would just, that was one thing that, that caught my eye, but I don't have any other comments. Mr. Rapley, oh, I'm sorry, I think we can get that clarified, obviously, when uh, we sit down and, and, and do the negotiation piece before signing the contract and working out those details as far as travel for implementation. Mr. Rapley, uh, in, in springboarding on her question, so, and this is probably one for you too, Debbie, this is, a, this is actually a turnkey operation and what will end up happening as far as outside expenses. Let's talk about that for a minute. So where are these people coming from that are going to be here? Is it Dallas, Houston, New York? Uh, where did these, like the gentleman I talked to the other day when they were giving the presentation, uh, will, they be, will he be part of this, Tyler uh, Technologies? Come on up. Mayor, the gentleman you met, he's actually out of Lubbock, where okay. they're based. They're, I was going to say, they're um, based, but they do have um, diff people in different areas. I don't know who would be coming to train, train you, but they hire contractors a lot of times to come train. Also, um, there, there is a lot of experience in the room um, with Laura. She's been through um, a, to, uh, several conversions um, to ENCODE, so I think you do have some experience there. So this figure of $100,000 add-on for expenses? I think you're probably going to look at um, maybe a conversion, uh, somebody staying in a hotel, or maybe one or two people. Um, you know, the last one that I saw happen, they weren't, the water, they had to convert water, um, police tickets, and um, all of their permitting, so um, that wasn't on there, and it took uh, considerably longer. I would assume that this would be one or two weeks. Right. And um, most of this is obviously the first part of that is the data conversion, mm -hmm. and then the implementation of the software. Okay, I still I still didn't hear it. What so is this a three week process, four weeks process, ten year process? No, it's not. A uh, process. Will I live to see it? When once they convert the data. How old are you? Um. 64 and fading fast. Yeah, may, may or may not, I don't know. Um, so, you know, the, they convert your data for you. And so when they convert the data, um, it depends on how much, it, you know, you, I've seen them where people don't know ENCODE, so they have to come in and train, um, depending on the staff you have who knows ENCODE um, financial. Financially, I know um, both Ryan and Laura have worked with it, so you would need less, um, you know, less time for training. So um, I think the my understanding generally is in the the data conversion would be part of that 31.5. I have not looked at your contract. I don't know what is in it, but I do suspect you would be paying travel from um, somewhere, and I would assume it would be in the state of Texas. It may be Dallas or Lubbock. Um, okay. But I don't think there's anybody here in San Antonio that they contract with. I'm not, I mean, I shouldn't say that because it's been four years since I've seen. But you're know, three relatively years. sure it's not going to cost $100,000 for expenses for, for, no, 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 no. for somebody, I, I, I guess, unless they're staying in the. Um, no, the parameters, the parameters. It was today or Tuesday. Okay, so all right. Today. Okay, so all right. Well, I don't know. Maybe they're going to stay at the Dominion Hotel and thousand bucks a night. I don't know. Okay, good. Mayor. So yes. Can I make a point? Um, just uh, off Councilman Trevino earlier, as far as clarification, that um, currently there is an annual maintenance with assist right now, roughly three thousand, I believe, Laura. And so again, moving up to this annual maintenance is uh, roughly about thirteen. So it's about ten thousand a year difference. Uh, from that standpoint over the five years plus the one-time fee. Okay, thank you. All right, Council, is there any other questions you have or comments? Uh, looks like the audience has, and the um, people who signed up for this have spoke their minds. 
So with that said, uh, any other questions? Okay. With that said, let's uh, go ahead and we have a motion on the table. And we have a second. All in favor of moving forward with this and going ahead and authorize the city manager, raise your hands, please. Four. Douglas? One. Huh? He opposed. So it's four to one. It passes. Ms. Nora? Thank you. Will you notify them that we're going to do that in the morning, please? Thank you. All right. Let's go on to the next item, which is uh, considering, uh, Debbie, have a safe trip, will you? Good. Okay. Consider an act upon ordinance number, excuse me, this is a, rev a resolution, 1810508A, authorizing the city manager to transfer $36,426 to the Supplemental Street and Drainage Maintenance Fund, also known as Fund 22. Mr. Rapley? Yes, Mayor. Uh, as Ms. Frazier had mentioned during the presentation, the surplus dollars that are um, put back in this year, obviously, that it was 36426 uh, which makes up that total street fund of about 635 uh, 602 So what we wanted to be able to do, I, I understand it was mentioned each year in the audit, but uh, as a part of signifying that transfer, we wanted to do it by resolution just to make sure it's clear and the process is, is transparent from that standpoint. Thank you. Okay. So um, this is a resolution of authorizing the city manager. Do I have a motion, please? Do I have a second? Second. Mr. Trevino, thank you for that second. There is no one signed up for this. So with that said, is there any comments? Mr. Gregory, do you have any comments for the item, please? No, sir. Thank you. Mr. Paul? Ms. McLean? No. Ms. Scott? No. Mr. Trevino? I appreciate the transparency. Thank you. Okay, so let's take a vote. All in favor? It is unanimous. Thank you, Council. Okay, uh, we've already considered three. All right, let's move on to the granddaddy. Consider and act upon resolution number R180505B, declaring support for the redevelopment of the Wedgwood Building, located at 6701 Blanco Road, Castle Hills, Texas. Mr. Rapley? Sorry, Mayor. I was speaking to Mr. Brennan. That's all right. <clears throat> yes, um, the, the Wedgwood development, uh, the Wedgwood building has a, a new potential investor and developer. Uh, they are actually uh, working towards getting financial support. Um, in the packet there, there's a letter that was signed by you uh, in regards to supporting this uh, proposed development. The, um, I guess the financial um, or the banking um, group asked for them to have a collective body or a resolution uh, from the community. And so this was the resolution that was proposed from that standpoint. Um, I understand there might've been someone here for that particular development. Uh, to speak on behalf of it, if necessary. Yes. Um, it's the last item on the agenda, right? Mm -hmm. I'd like to hear that. Sir? Good evening, Council. Patrick Christensen here on behalf of the, the potential buyers. It's actually Pat Bernacki with 6701 Blanco Road LP. That's an entity that's purchasing the, the Wedgwood Towers, if you will. Um, basically what they're doing is they're applying for historic tax credits. These aren't to be confused with any kind of low income tax credits. These are tax credits the government has basically to support the rehabilitation of historic buildings. The Wedgwood Tower was designed by a famous architect whose name is escaping me at the moment, but as a, as a 
building within the National Register of Historic Places, they can apply for these tax credits and that helps them, will help them remodel the building and get it functioning again. Thank you. And that's why we're here, thank you. Um, is it, let's get a motion and let's get a second. Then I'm, I have a few questions and I'm sure council does too. So moved. Thank I'll you. Second. Second, Ms. Scott, uh, Mr. Trevino was the uh, motion. Um, Mr. Brennan, is it proper now to, to ask the gentleman, council asks the gentleman, um, let's see, this is five. So we have one that they're doing in here. We have two people signed up, okay, to speak on this. Okay, is it proper to ask them the, uh, the nature of this, whether there's going to be uh, proposed economic development in there as far as shops or anything, or is this just a general resolution to say, you know what, the city sort of welcomes you with open arms? Well, uh, if I were you, I didn't, and he's standing there, I'd ask him any question you can think of. He doesn't have to answer it. So I'd have at it. Well, you know, he's closest to the person who's building it, so I guess it'd be better than <laughs> yeah. some other type of rumors that might start out there. So with that said, Mr. Trevino, do you want to ask the gentleman any questions? Can you give us any kind of idea of what the proposed development might be? Okay, so um, just to quickly mention what you said about economic development. Interestingly enough, the, uh, the previous owners platted out some of the frontage there along Blanco Road. So the intention is after we get Wedgwood up and running is to basically build a small shopping center right there, maybe something like Starbucks, things like that. They're on Blanco. Um, as far as, uh, and again, your question, please. I'm sorry, I kind of went off on Just the, <laughs> kind of what y'all's vision is for the property. Basically to restore it as, as senior housing. Um, that's the goal. Uh, the building needs extensive renovations. It needs updating with fire alarms, fire sprinkler systems, things like that, so it could be a safe development. Um, and as part of that process, um, we're pursuing these tax credits plus also bank financing to, to finance that, that remodeling and, and rehabilitation. It's been vacant for four years now. It, it needs significant work, significant upgrades. Sure. Uh, I noticed there was a little bit of a difference between the uh, resolution posted and the I guess an amendment, and I was just checking to see if you could speak to that, please. Sure, I think there was some concern with the mention of uh, affordable housing meant some sort of low income housing. That was not the case. By affordable, they simply meant market rate, not necessarily luxury housing, but market rate housing. And I believe our current model has the monthly rents of being $1,351 sure. for a one bedroom apartment. Wow. Well, it includes, includes amenities, it includes uh, continental breakfast every morning, all utilities, cable, internet, and uh, some various um, services, including, you know, checking up on the residents. On so there's going to be extensive renovation in there. Absolutely. It, yeah. it needs complete renovation. I mean, not only to the fire damage, but new furniture, new everything. Wow. Especially fire alarm and fire sprinkler. Wow. <laughs> Miss, oh, sorry. Sorry, may I proceed? Uh, do you have a project, projected value after renovation? I believe I do. Let me see. I want to say I, it's, and, I, and I'm not the, the developer. I'm and the not developer's hold land use attorney. Uh, I know it's more than $20 million. At least that's what the ad valorem tax value will be. Thank you. Um, I think that's it for now, Mayor. Thanks. Thank you, Mr. Trevino. Ms. Scott, did you have any questions for the gentleman? And, I, and I'm sorry, I, your name Patrick again? Christensen, I'm sorry. Patrick, yes, sir. Yes. Thank you. Um, I think Mr. Trevino covered most of them. Specifically, like I said, with the new resolution, um, I, I did have questions in the wording, and I was very, very relieved to find that it's sustainable to the current market values of what apartments are going for for senior living um, in our community. And um, I want to thank you for bringing this forward. Sure. We apologize for that uh, miscommunication. Ms. McLean. I'll be happy to see some, some action and life over there again because we live just behind there. So um, I pass it a lot and, and I'm sad every time I see it. So I'm happy, to, happy that you brought this forward. I'm happy with the revised resolution that we have and I'm really excited to see how this building turns into a shining star again. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. McLean. Mr. Paul. Just one for Mr. Brennan. 
the last whereas, where the uh, phrase with a sustainable market value, and then below it, be it resolved, do we need to bring that down into that paragraph also, or is the way the paragraph written okay? Uh, I, you know, the whereas is are all the predicates for the final resolution, uh, so I think it's fine the way it is. I mean, anybody okay. that reads this uh, has to incorporate all the stuff above into what their interpretation is. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Gregory. Are you familiar with senior living housing projects here in San Antonio of comparable cost? I'm not aware of any rehabilitations like this of a large senior housing tower. Um, I know that the, for example, just using what, what limited examples there are of older housing stock like this, uh, the San Antonio Housing Authority has gone through and done some rehabilitations, but nothing to this extent that I'm aware of. Most everything is, right, but that was, that was, you know, constructed from scratch. It was new. I, I, you know, it hasn't been shut down for four years. This is kind of a unique project. What about Army residents? Again, that, that is another hmm. senior tower. There's also Air Force Village. There's a lot of different communities like this. But none of these that I'm aware of have been vacant for four years and need to be sig significantly rehabilitated. So is this community similar to the forum in that it, that aspect of the forum where people buy or rent their apartments and it gives them meals and this, that, and the other? Does there, is there any other amenity that is planned by the developer other than me? I guess they're planning meals? Well, breakfast meals. There'll be a continental breakfast, breakfast is a okay. part of it, but they will have their own kitchens um, for, for lunch and dinner, and they don't have to participate in breakfast right. if they want to. And there'll be, um, it's not a nursing home where there's nurses checking on, on people like on an hourly basis, but certainly there will be people that are checking on them on a daily basis to make sure they're okay. So it's kind of, kind of independent living, if you will, versus a nursing home. So if you're going to have additional stores and restaurants you, you expect to possibly expand correct in the front correct where do you get the parking for that well we've talked four ideas of putting the parking below i mean using some of the parking for the residents below the the commercial structures i mean like we don't have the final design plan i was just stating that it was platted for that intent in the future um, seniors really? don't necessarily always have their own car sometimes they do sometimes they don't so it was originally planted for underground parking for the commercial, for the on, commercial. on the front. Well, so really? ag again, the com uh, underground parking would be used by the residents and some kind of parking on the surface would be used for visitors to the commercial. We haven't worked that out yet. We don't have the building design plans yet. It's just, it's been platted that way, so we're exploring that possibility. What is the earliest you think this could be completed? The residential tower. Uh, we want to work on it uh, within phases, so we're hoping within two to three years it'll be fully functional and up and running. Well, I appreciate the change in verbiage because the original thing did sort of send chills up my spine, and I appreciate the clarification. We apologize of the verbiage for that. Used. Thank you. Uh, just two more quick things. Number one, uh, last I think it was last year we approved the parking to be reduced from two to one and a half per apartment, and I think this is probably what the people had thinking about the potential. The second thing is that this is just a resolution saying we want you guys here, and, and it has nothing to do with zonings or SUPs or architect or anything. We want you guys here, and this is an affirmation of that. Is this not correct, Mr. Brennan? Thank you. Yes, and just to emphasize the point, Mr. Paul, that there's no financial incentives tied to this. Pat, uh, you don't know me, but I guess everybody in the building who's here now does. I was one of the ones that saw the first brick go into the Wedgwood, standing on the uh, four-way stop at, at Loop 13 and uh, Blanco Road. My father told me there was going to be a big building there someday. Uh, Fifty-nine years later, my mother died in that building on the fifth floor. And uh, my dad played as a jazz musician in the club up at the top when she would let him out from time to time from our house. So uh, I wanna congratulate you and tell you that as far as I'm concerned, which I'll be up here another year, uh, we welcome you and, and we welcome uh, what, you're, what you're planning to do there. And, and I hope that uh, you will see, 
you know, you will see the city is so, I suspect there's gonna be a lot of people who uh, uh, live in the city, possibly move there someday. Uh, one question I did have, is there rules as far as pe people being able to walk in and walk, I mean, I realize wheelchairs and scooters these days, but but is, is there rules as far as when a person becomes incapacitated? Well, set up at this point. Well, if they're incapacitated in some way and they're no, no longer independent living, they will probably have to transition into it. Okay, I just, I just want to make sure because sure. some people have a lot of money and you could set up Methodist Hospital in one of those rooms. And, uh, you know, uh, IVs, whatever it might right. be. And I just want to make sure that this was, uh, the intention was and that we make sure that there's, there's some kind of rules in, that people walk in and walk out or they are able to get in and get out by their uh, wheelchair, scooter, uh, whatever it is. It's intended to, to be independent living with some amenities and gotcha. checking up on people. Okay. To make sure they're okay. Uh, we do have a couple of people signed up for this, and let's see, this is item. Ah, here we go. John Kinney. <clears throat> Excuse me. Good evening. John Kenny, 103 Briarcliff. Um, I, I'm amazed that we would even consider turning the Wedgwood back into a senior living, independent living facility uh, to set us up for the same possible terrible action that happened uh, a few years back. Um, Mr. Gregory, the, to answer your question, there's 3,249 project-based subsidized apartments in San Antonio. Um, I cannot believe that I have been misled on this topic. Several times over the years, I have been told that the redevelopment of the Wedgwood would not be Section 8 housing. How silly of me to not know better than the games of semantics we have been playing. Um, Mr. Mayor, in your letter to Mr. Bernanke, you mentioned a vital senior living option which is available and affordable. What is your definition of affordable? You speak of revitalization. How do you define revitalization? I don't believe those words work together in this situation. Affordable senior living is something that we as a society must consider. However, if we want to see Castle Hills as a city progress into the future and to truly revitalize the Blanco Road commercial corridor, there, then redeveloping the Wedgwood back into a civic, senior living facility and rebranding with a new name is not the way to go. Putting lipstick on a pig doesn't change the pig. It just makes how we look at the pig it changes how we look at the pig and we know how it makes the pig feel. Let, remind, let me remind you of a story on Ken's Five dated December 28, 2016. Amid the chaos, five people were killed, 18 sent to the hospital and more than 100 others experienced long-term effects of smoke and chemical inhalation. That's because these independent seniors were stuck on the 11th floor and if you don't think that that would happen again by doing another senior living facility, you're sadly mistaken. For the past months, again from the article, for the past few months, city leaders have been in talks with the owners of the original Wedwood Apartments discussing conceptual plans to build a new residential and retail facility. Maybe something like a mini, mini pearl, Howell said. Sorry, Tim, just mm -hmm. reading the article. The effort may get a boost from an ongoing effort to get the building listed on the National Register of Historic Places, which would allocate state and federal dollars for renovation. I also wonder how this right of revitalization plays into the city's master plan. Do we have a strategic plan for Castle Hills? How can you plan for the future when you do things like this that'll put us back to where we were in 2014? When will our council see that other small municipalities are doing planning to take them forward? Look at Alamo Heights. Why is Alamo Heights favored over Castle Hills? Our lots are bigger, our homes are nicer. People choose Alamo Heights over Castle Hills because you, our council, and councils in the past have not planned for our future. Shame on all of you. By the way, what is the status of the Economic Development Committee? What are the tax benefits to the Wedgwood, and more importantly, what is the tax burden to Castle Hills? Have we sat down with other developers to discuss opportunities? Have you, the council, sat down and brainstormed what could be? John F. Kennedy once said, 
The problems of the world cannot possibly be solved by skeptics or cynics whose horizons are limited by the obvious realities. We need people who can dream of things that never were and ask why not. There are too many questions left unanswered. I personally don't believe this whole redevelopment has been transparent, whether it's gonna be section eight, senior living independent. You know, if you remember the, the, the people who spoke on the news, um, they were saying things like, the bathrooms didn't even have the call button, they didn't have the, the pull cord. In an independent living facility, that's not required. The people who lived there felt they were in a nursing home. Um, I personally don't believe the whole redevelopment has been transparent. I urge you not to pass this resolution until all citizens' questions have been sufficiently answered. Change is the law of life, and those who look only to, be to the past or present are certain to miss the future. Change will happen in Castle Hills whether you or I or anyone sitting here or listening tonight likes it. Lead change into the future. Be leaders. Show all of us what you're made of. Create a plan for a better tomorrow. Don't destine us to the past. Don't pass this resolution. Thank you. Next on the list is Brother Dooling. He has gone home. Uh, Al, did you want to take his place? Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, council you members. Uh, John Kenny and I have not spoken about this before. We are close friends. What John Kenny had to say reflects almost 100% of what I had to say. I do have concerns. I'm a proud resident of Castle Hills. I pay my taxes, high taxes. I want to live here. My thought after that travesty that happened at the Wedgwood was that when it would, when it's renovated into a nice semi-luxury apartment complex, I could live there. But if it's going to be a, a senior home, as a senior, I think I would know when to leave the place. But if I get into a 400 square foot apartment in there, and my rent is $1,200 a month, and I have the illusion that it's a nursing home or a senior citizen home, I'm not going anywhere. And I'm afraid that that's what's gonna happen. We're gonna get in there thinking that it's gonna progress, thinking that it's gonna be a positive place to live, and we're gonna stay there, we're gonna need, we're gonna need services to come help us, and that place will not have the facility. I certainly would hate to be on the eighth floor and not be able to be taken down by ambulance if a travesty was to happen again. Uh, a question that I have is, our revenues are set, our taxes used to, uh, our, our revenue was 75 percent down since the fire. Obviously there's no residents living there. What is gonna be the cost of our fire department, of our police department having to respond once again to every phone call every 911 call that will come in and they'll have to respond. Is that gonna take away from the citizens of Castle Hills or is that gonna raise our taxes so we can continue to get those services? Um, there's a lot of questions to be asked. John mentioned a lot of them, John Kenny did. Um, my basic question is when you say Starbucks and things like that, are we talking about a thing like a 7-Eleven, a laundromat, uh, those are really basic questions, but I too am opposed to senior living. If we're gonna do something with it, get a company, get a bank that's gonna come invest a little bit more, make it an attractive place for younger people to move into, maybe not families or maybe families, but make it somewhere that's gonna be attractive for the general community, i.e. the Pearl, i.e. Southtown, places that are being renovated that do bring in income to our community. Thank you, Mr. Muller. Thank you, sir. Appreciate you. Robbie, you're not signed up, but did you wanna, did you wanna speak? I will. Thank you. I'm delighted to have you all here, but I would prefer that you have 
this like an, uh, maybe an executive apartment or a millennial apartment or something that's going to uh, bring the young people in and not another senior living. I know that seniors need a place to live, uh, but, uh, you know, not there. I mean, this, this building has such an opportunity to become a very first class executive apartment where people just fly in uh, and come in for a week. You know, they, companies that have uh, apartments here that they send people in and out or, or young people that uh, can go directly downtown to work or out to Stone Oak or wherever. But I would love to see it be a younger, lively, apartment. Thank you, Robbie. Thank you. I appreciate it. Careful, though. The last time I said something about young people, I was uh, chastised greatly in a letter that a resident sent out. But anyway, Ms. Winger, you wanted to speak? Speaking of that? Thank you, Robbie. Thank you. Um, yes, Leslie Wenger, 137 Lou John, and of course the neighborhood I live in abuts um, the Wedgwood. Uh, my concern is the same concern that I expressed uh, during the zoning commission. There is nothing definite here. We do not know, this is a potential developer as the gentleman just said. So that's what we had before. We do not know who the developer is. You're saying welcome to somebody who doesn't actually exist yet. Maybe they're gonna do it, maybe they're not. Um, he did mention low income tax credits. So whether we're talking about affordable or low income and there's some difference there, why are we talking about low income tax credits? Because John Kenny is correct. Low income tax credits are for section eight. I think you need to be very careful about saying welcome to that because that is not going to be anything that the city wants. Um, as far as whether it's a senior you know, living or not, that matters very much what type of senior living it is. Previously, when, when the Wedgwood was established, they did not allow people who were not mobile on their own. That changed over a period of time. Well, thank you, John. You're welcome. <laughs> Thanks. Um, so, I would hope that that wouldn't happen, but I don't know what you've changed in the resolution. Of course, all the rest of us have is what was in the packet, and you, you say over and over again. Now, historic tax credits, that's different from low-income tax credits, but nothing has been put in paper. You have before you somebody who may or may not be developing the building. There is nothing definite put on paper that says this is a contract. I would like to see that presented to council first before we welcome anybody here because we don't know what's going to happen. It's all just talk. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, so did you apply for low income tax credits? Where did that come from? Well, we do have... Patrick, welcome to Castle Hills, sir. It's amazing how news gets started around here. No, he didn't. He said he did not, Leslie. Mr. Patrick, would you like to come up here again and explain about uh, your intentions on low-income people? I think there was a problem. Yes, what I said was this is not for low-income tax credits. This is for historic tax credit for his I don't know if this is on or not historic tax credits that allow developers to apply for tax credits for historic buildings this is a historic building this is another mechanism where we can have some funds to rehabilitate the buildings it's gonna be a very expensive rehabilitation so anything we can do to try to help that like historic tax credits we want to apply for okay Mary, may I ask a quick question sure uh, I 
hear you. I understand that it is not low income tax credits. What assurance do we have that the developer decides to go to low income tax credits? Because that's obviously a point of contention here. Well, I believe the resolution, I'll have to read through it again, but I believe it mentions historic tax credits, does it not? It doesn't say, it doesn't exclude them. I just don't.